Good evening, everyone. It's still the final. It's still the final council meeting of this term of council. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all here tonight. We have a very crazy, very large uh, agenda tonight, so we're going to try to get through it. We're going to go slowly and hopefully get it all finished. Uh, we have taken attendance. We're all here, but Councillor Gatward. Uh, we have two things to put on the agenda. We have a, um, an extra delegation, 4.5. We have a bylaw, 1421. Does anyone else have anything else to add to our agenda? Thank you. Approval of the agenda, please. Uh, Mr. Mayor, it's moved by myself, second by Council Leferrier, that the County Brant Council agenda and addendum, including bylaw 110-22, September 27, 2022, be approved. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Declaration of pecuniary interest. Do we have any? If you find yourself in that position, please declare at the time of the issue. Moving on to number four, which is our delegations. The first delegation is going to be a... Um, public meeting. So what I'm going to do is 4.1, and this is the meeting to present notice of considerations for the engineer's drainage report for the Mather drain improvement plan. So I'm now going to declare this a public meeting, and I declare it open. And I would like to call on Mr. Curtis McIntyre, please, to come up and present, knowing that you have 10 minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, please note to Madam Clerk that Joan Gatward just uh, zoomed in. Uh, Mr. McIntyre? Hello. Can Thank you. you. Welcome. Thank you. If you want to present, please. Oh, I am sorry. Um, Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and members of Council. Uh, my name is Curtis McIntyre, and I'm here to present uh, Case Smart's uh, drain report on the major drain 2022. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. So, is everybody able to uh, see the watershed plan? Not yet. Not yet. Um, now we do. There you go. Okay. Th thank you. Full screen mode. Okay, so this project uh, was initiated under Section 78 of the Drainage Act from a request of improvement of the drain uh, made by Lola May Farms uh, in the fall of 2018. Uh, later in that project, um, a petition was filed by Patrick and Joanne Talbot, uh, as well as Joseph Clover. He Joseph Clover is Lola May Farms uh, for a new branch drain to improve uh, the northwest corner of the Lola May Farms property. This is up in here and the southeast corner of the Talbot Farm in Lot 1, Lot 1, Concession 7 of, of the Township of Norwich. So just to help orientate everybody, uh, the Mather Drain watershed is centered around the intersection of, of Muir Road South and uh, the 8th Concession Road over on the far west side of the county, bordering with uh, the Township of Norwich. Uh, the Mather Drain was originally constructed under a report under the Drainage Act in 1970, and uh, it consisted of a main drain, which follows the path of my cursor up through the Lola May Farms across 8th Concession Road, and then back again across Muir Road South and an A branch. Um, the on site meeting for this project was uh, held in July of 2019. The uh, main takeaway from that meeting was that the, the clofers who, who made the original request for improvement felt that the, the drain as it is is working well, just it needed more, more capacity. Um, so we knew right away that uh, our, our main objective was to probably to twin the existing drain, put a new tile beside uh, the current tile that's there. Only other comment that came out of that meeting was that uh, Mr. Clofer said that the northwest corner of his farm, I'll zoom in, um, right around the intersection of Concession Road 8 and Muir Road South. Uh, experienced um, wet areas from water that was crossing a culvert under Muir Road South coming from the, the old Mather farm on the west side of uh, Muir Road South. Um, this farm was going through a sale at the time. The, the, the farmer who, who rented the land for a number of years was taking purchase of it, and he was... Uh, 
doing drainage improvements and was willing to sign a petition, but we couldn't sign the petition until he took legal ownership of the property, which took some time and delayed the project a little bit. So once we received that petition, we, we had a meeting with all the owners in the watershed. We went over our proposed design and, and costing, um, as well as discuss this new petition. Uh, mind, I don't think there was really any concerns from any owners about the costs or the or the work generally um, speaking. Uh, one final point I'd like to make is that uh, all along we knew that the proposing proposal of this branch drain was going to cross uh, an eight inch gas line, high pressure Enbridge gas line that runs along Muir Road South. Um, and that uh, we felt that at this meeting, we knew we would have enough um, grade downstream to, to be able to cross this pipeline. Uh, we waited till after to, to daylight it um, using HydroVac services. And, uh, but we knew we'd have enough to, uh, depth downstream on the main drain to, to make this work and that whatever added costs were added to the project from having to install this around a gas line would be assessed to Enbridge Gas under Section 26 of the Drainage Act because they are a utility. So uh, this gets to my report. The report proposes to install a construction of a new tile along the main drain of, uh, sorry, 842 meters. Sorry, I just wanted to get the length. 842 meters of 600 millimeter diameter to 525 millimeter, millimeter diameter, that's um, 24 inch and 21 inch of tile along the existing drain, uh, as well as the installation of 500 millimeter diameter steel pipe crossing of 8th Concession Road. Uh, we propose to do that by jack and boring, so that's not open cutting it, but uh, pushing a pipe underneath the road. And then as well, we propose a new B branch, and this B branch consists of 62 meters of solid plastic pipe. Um, why we're going with solid plastic pipe is we get a little bit deeper because we have to go underneath the the eight inch gas line and we have to provide the clearance that Enbridge requires. So we're proposing plastic pipe there, and as well, it would be a um, a new 300 millimeter diameter steel pipe crossing of Muir Road South again by Jack and Bohr that road's pretty busy, so we figured that that would be the way to go about that. Um, both road crossings would contain new catch basins on either side of the road. And the last thing, we're just proposing 80 meters of clean out of uh, what they call Big Creek downstream of the main drain. It's really just to provide a little more uh, freeboard for the new tile that we're putting in. So if I switch over to here, I'll switch over to page 16 of my report. Um, Escape out of this down to the cost. Uh, the estimate for the cost of construction is approximately one hundred and sixty thousand uh, dollars. We've allotted eighty six hundred dollars to be provided in allowances. Uh, the majority of this total is considered as damages to crops uh, when we go through and construct the drain, and with additional amount for the right of way for the drain to use um, people's lands. So that makes up the allowance totals. Uh, finally, the total engineering estimate in the report, as well as the hydrovac work that we did uh, to locate fiber optic lines and uh, that gas line, as I discussed, as well as the construction supervision that we estimate totals $77,000 for a total project cost of $254,000. Um, at this meeting, I, I, we don't get into how assessments were made, but I'll just add that our report does include uh, Schedule A, which is uh, a schedule to be used for assessing out the construction work that we propose. Uh, schedule B is used later in the future for assessing out future maintenance costs. And a Schedule C is the takes the gross assessments from Schedule A and just adds in the one-third grant that farm properties would receive so that uh, we get a net assessment to, to all properties. That That's all I have to present on the Mather Drain. I'd be happy to uh, take any questions that you have at this time. Thank you. Uh, because this is a public meeting, is there anyone from the public who wants to speak to this report? 
I'll ask the second time, is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak to this report? And the third time, anyone in the public wanting to speak to this report? Seeing none, we will move on. Does anyone want their name added to the petition at this point? Seeing none, does anyone want their name taken off the petition at this point? Seeing none, uh, I will declare that the meeting is closed and call on Councillor Gatward. Mr. Mayor, are we allowed to ask questions of the presenter? I'm sorry, certainly. I got a question. Sure, yeah. Okay. Councillor Miller. Thank you. Uh, for, for, for the presenter, Curtis, um, two, two specific questions, one general question. And uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Um, the first specific question is uh, regarding Enbridge. Um, I guess you said the engineer is okay with uh, the 60 centimeter vertical separation between the pipeline. I hope that's enough. That's a big pipeline. You don't want to bust it. Um, the 26,740 that they're assessed, there's some, um, I understand how you assess the landowners. That special assessment, there, there's a method of doing that. I, I, I have to assume you didn't just pull it out of a hat or anything. Yes. Um, sorry, I think this is Councillor Miller. I think I'm, I'm addressing here. Yes. Um, yes. So, so your first question. Yes, they the Enbridge has um, procedures. They they give us a document that um, that we're supposed to uh, follow for for crossing their gas lines. I did. I have did actually specifically talk to um, a representative of Enbridge on this, and uh, they had no concerns with our crossing as we're proposed. I think in the in the past it actually. They didn't even require two feet of clearance. It was it was more like one foot for certain pipelines, two feet for vital pipelines. And then they told me that they went and reclassified a bunch more to be vital pipelines. So so that made a lot more required to, to cross with a two foot clearance. Now that's it is important to make sure we don't have hit a, a pipeline. It's very vital. Two feet of clearance makes it challenging on many jobs to be able to because our, our pipe our pipe drains need to continuously flow downstream so that can be a challenge but anyways to, to address your point yes no they, they're um they didn't have any concerns with our crossing we still have to when we get a contractor uh we have to make a final application to them and, and uh crossing application i think that's going to be go through the county um, but i did get um the okay from them up front and then to your question about assessments, yeah, so with the same, they operate the same as roads do under the Drainage Act. And what we do is we take, we take the full cost of construction that is directly uh, required to either cross the road, which under, is, is under road crossings, or across the pipeline. And we take that total cost. We subtract out what an equivalent cost would be if, say, that utility wasn't there. Say there was no pipeline at all, there was no road there, it'd be a lot cheaper to, to put in concrete tile. So we subtract that out, and then we add in what we feel is our engineering costs, what I feel like I've incurred to date, and what I'm going to incur in the future to, to continue working along with, um, to cross either of those. And that's how we get to a special assessment. Um, what I did on this job is I knew that I, when I went to the second meeting, I pretty much had the d drain all designed and costed out. And I knew that we would have to make a little bit of a, a change for Enbridge. And uh, so I knew what my total costs were at that time. When we left that meeting, we did the daylighting of the, of the gas line, um, which costed a certain amount of money. And I spent some more time revising design, going back with them. And so I knew exactly how much engineering costs I had incurred that is directly all Enbridge related. And it doesn't, it's not costs that are, are farm related. It's not costs that are related to the road. It's all costs that is Enbridge related. And so, so I was pretty comfortable with what the amount of money that is spent should be assessed to Enbridge for having to cross that utility. Okay. So hopefully I that. Yeah, no, it, it does sound fair. Um, I'm trying to keep Enbridge sweet, so I don't want you stirring yep. a, a bee's nest there. Um, second oh, yeah. specific question, um, under uh, section, general conditions, 
200.13, you said regarding subcontractors, and I'll quote, if, if the municipality so directs, the contractor shall not sublet the whole or any part of this contract without the approval of the engineer. So it, it's the ball's in our court on that one, but I don't know what would be the advantage of so directing the contractor versus the disadvantage of not doing that. So um, do we, yeah. I don't know if we look to our general manager. Do we look to you to, to help us on that question? I mean, yeah, you know, we could I, certainly I, pass I, um, a motion to make it happen, but I just, like I said, I, I don't know. It was, I don't, I'm not sure which way we should be leaning on that question. I would say we as engineers often put clauses in like this so that we make sure that decisions like this do at least come through us in charge. Um, it, this is this is just general conditions that are case mark general conditions. I didn't technically write the this part for this report. I didn't write that for this specific major drain. It's what we use all the time. Um, when we do the tender, if it's something that uh, if there's any say conditions that are problematic, we can we can change those. But uh, we do often in these general conditions for all of, all contracts, not even just drains. We do often put things like that in there to say that. Um, you know, it shouldn't be done unless unless it's approached by us and we approve it. Um, well, I say us; it would also be the county as well. So, um, it's just something that's that's in our general conditions uh, that's been there for for a while. How many jobs? Okay, sorry, I, I thought I was reading that maybe because you're near a huge gas line, but pipe. I don't know. But okay, last question, and it's just it's a general uh, general question. Um, you said the improvement request letter came in. Uh, I think it was October 2018. And if I ask the average person on the street, uh, if, if they're asked in October, the fall of one year, I would say most people would say, well, work will probably start in the springtime of 2019. Obviously, that's not the case. We're five years hence. I understand, uh, you know, there's a few other things. Maybe it's a little more complicated. But every year we delay fixing a drain, you know, there's crop loss. Um, there's counselors that get yelled at. Is there anything... Is there anything we as a municipality can do to, to, to kind of shorten those timelines? It's an excellent question. I'm, I'm, I am actually glad you brought that up because I thought about it as well, but, and I prepared it because I, I don't like that it takes that amount of time. It, it, uh, it shouldn't in an ideal world. I would say that speaking for myself, that there is a lot of work out there and not that many firms that do it. Um, so we do get backlog longer than I prefer and I don't like uh, taking a long time this specific job I will say that it it started with a colleague of mine it it got appointed to a colleague of mine who ended up um, switching switching workplaces and then uh, so it changed it changed in hands in our in our company and it got taken over by my mentor Ken Smart and he was sort of doing that waiting for me to become an engineer I wasn't an engineer yet at the time and then the one other thing that happened, um, other than the, the petition kind of took some time to come in, and that's why we were waiting, is that uh, COVID slowed things down in the middle. Um, and that might have slowed down the petition as well. I'm not sure. I'd say there's a couple of things why this one took longer than it should. Um, as, as to how things improve, I don't know if I have exact uh, comments to, to the County of Branch, but I've heard positive things um, lately um, about improvement work. And I'm working with uh, with Shannon Tweedle, your new drainage superintendent, on another project. So I, I think things uh, are looking like they're improving, but I don't know County of Brant that, that uh, well. So I don't know exactly. Sorry. Okay. Um, don't give up on finding an answer for me. And if you come up with something, I'd appreciate an email from you. But uh, thank you for your answer. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your questions, Councillor Miller. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, uh, Councillor Gatwood, I'm looking for a motion to accept this information, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And before I read the motion, I just wanted to note for the clerk that I was um, zoomed in at 559 and I was in the waiting room for a couple minutes. So that's why you missed me. And I did have one item for um, other business under the approval of agenda. So thank you. And the motion reads, it's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Howes 
that the presentation from Curtis McIntyre of Case Smart Associates Limited be received as information. And if no petitioners have removed their name from the original petition, that council give two readings to the Mather Drain bylaw and adopt the report as a provisional bylaw. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. I've given it already three readings. And I'm now going to call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. I now declare the public meeting closed. Taking us to 4.2 on our agenda, uh, Cam Johnson from Millards. Uh, he's going to present to us. Hello, Cam. Again, my name is Cameron Johnson. I'm a partner with Millard Rose Roseburg. It's my privilege tonight to present the audited financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2021. First of all, I'd like to say it's nice to be back in person. Much better than Zoom. Um, you have the, the copy of the financial statements plus also a, a report to the members of Brent County Council. I'll just highlight a couple of points very briefly. I'll suspend with going through both of those reports in detail, but um, our report, too, on the financial statements is an unqualified report, so it is a clean audit opinion. We, I also report that we are independent of the County of Brant. <clears throat> we don't have a relationship with the county other than performing the audit. Um, the audit fees themselves are not material to the firm, so there's no independence issue. Also highlight the point is, and it states this in an auditor's report as well, is that management's responsible for the preparation of the financial statements. Um, where our responsibility is to issue an audit opinion on those financial statements. And also at the, throughout the course of the audit and at the conclusion of the audit, we seek representations from management related to various matters. And we've received a, that signed letter of representation from management at the conclusion of the audit. Some reportable matters, significant accounting policies and changes. We note that there was, didn't notice any significant changes in accounting policies this year. Um, one of the points that I've made in the past is that if you want to manipulate your income, uh, it's very simple by changing an accounting policy. You can have a material change to your income of an entity. Um, the important part about that is that that uh, change in accounting policy is done for uh, uh, better reporting purposes, and it's also done on a consistent basis. So you can change this year's, but it also forces you to retrospectively change the financial statements from previous years for changes in accounting policies. Um, materiality, we always take a look at a level of materiality where we consider uh, at what point would the decisions of the users of the statements be changed by a level, uh, by a number that would be changing in the financial statements. That performance materiality we look at is around $1.5 million, but we also assess a summary of differences throughout the year. So we take a look at in the, during the course of our audit, if we come across something that is different than what's been reported, we take a look at that. Um, and then we report, we record a summary of some unadjusted differences. In total, the unadjusted differences are under $50,000 in the year. So the statements are by no means uh, materially or even insignificantly different than what we would have audited. <clears throat> we have had significantly larger unadjusted differences in the past, and most of that is just dealing with a timing difference. Where we come across the majority of those types of differences is uh, Heather and her staff, you know, they'll take a look at accounts payable for the end of the year, and they'll be looking at that to the end of February, for example. Well, we're coming in in April, May, June to take a look at the audited records, so we'll have, you know, three months more work of work from, say, an engineer certificate that comes in at a later date and dealing with the payable associated with an engineer certificate, that type of thing. So we report that there was no significant audit adjustments throughout the course of the audit. Uh, other misstatements, we also report that uh, there was no evidence of fraud or other irregularities during the course of our audit. Uh, one of the things that we do each year is we also update internal controls, our, our, our notes on internal controls, and during the year we did not discover any significant deficiencies in internal controls. We report that we did not have any significant difficulties or any difficulties throughout the course of the audit. 
And with Heather Mifflin and her staff, we also report that we've received excellent cooperation during the course of the audit. So there's no issues. <clears throat> One thing I'd just highlight very quickly on, on the audited financial statements, we are issuing a clean opinion, as I stated, and that sort of comes down to the, <clears throat> the second paragraph on the auditor's report, and it states, you know, in our opinion, the accompanying consolidated financial statements present fairly in all material respects the consolidated financial position of the county of, of the county as at December 31, 2021, and the results of its operations and its changes in net assets and cash flows for the year then ended in accordance with Canadian public sector accounting standards. And these financial statements are dated at the date of approval by finance at September 22, 2022. Um, one note, you know, uh, as council I think is aware, is that you know your actual cash surplus in the year, so your budgeted surplus in the year was 1.26 million. The financial statements highlight a annual surplus on page five of about 24 million dollars. As as the council is aware, is that these financial statements are consolidated financial statements, so we're also including. Uh, the library, we're including a, a percentage of John Noble Home into these financial statements as well. Um, but also most significantly is these are on a full accrual basis. We're including uh, liabilities in these financial statements that would normally not be recorded. We are recording um, uh, landfill liability, uh, future benefit liability, but mostly is we're also recording tangible capital assets. So when you spent $100,000 or $227,000 on a new drain that would show up as an expense on the cash budget, we were going to be re we would be recording that as a capital asset. So it would not come through as an expense, it would come through as an asset and be depreciated over time. So that explains the majority of it. Overall, uh, very good. Uh, again, no issues throughout the course of the audit. And I believe, I guess through Mr. Mayor, if, there, if I could ask if there's any questions related to the audited financial statements. Thanks, Cam. Are there any questions to Cameron? Councillor Bell, first, then Councillor Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through you to Cam. Uh, two questions. Uh, one is on page five, which is the consolidated statement of operations and surplus. Just a question, really, about why in our budget we don't include development charges, which then turn up on the actuals, and it's quite a sizable number. It's nine million dollars is that something about our budgeting process we need to to think about heather would you through you mr mayor um the budget there is the operating budget so uh, where development charges is used it's in the capital budget so it's not seen this the numbers reported here beside the actuals are for the uh, or is just the operating day-to-day -day budget, not the capital budget? You know, I just never like to see, sir, through you, Mr. Mayor, I never like to see large discrepancies between budget and actual, and this one is two, uh, $27 million, <coughs> so it, it's quite a big number. Um, and my, my second question, if I may, is on page 11, which is around the um, operation of school boards. It, it, just a surprise that, that we actually gave less property tax in 2021 than we did in 2020. And it sort of runs counter to the uh, the opinions that I pick up in our community that says our schools are chock-a-block, chock they're full, we're at the limits. My assumption would be then that, that we would be giving more rather than less through property tax. It, it, could somebody explain that difference? Well, the the province sets the tax rate for the school boards, and it's it's done uh, more or less as you're not funding the school based on uh, the properties. It, your your contribution, the municipal municipality's contribution to the school board is part of the entire picture. So it's just a question of cash flow rather than total budgets. So it's not impacting the budget, but the province has had a mandate before of, of adjusting the amount of tax rate that is going through the schools and then be funding the schools otherwise. So, so I, I Mr. Mayor, would that, uh, could I imply then that the province is giving more money and, and the municipalities are giving less, or are they all reducing? Um, I can't recall what the tax rates are for the school board for 2021. Do you, it, 
that's a there you know it, it deals with each classification of tax rate um, in total chances are the, the school budgets have gone up significantly um, and again it's just you know if it's a you know if it's on 200 million dollars we're paying a little bit less but the taxpayer is going to be paying the balance uh, not as a rate payer but as a, as the province as the taxpayer one more question. Uh, in relation to investments, uh, which is note six on page 11, uh, the market value of our investments is $41 million. Um, am I correct in thinking that is the current value of the money that we received from, from selling Brant County Power uh, some years ago that has now grown in value? It is. Go ahead, Heather. Through you, Mr. Mayor, yes, the majority of the investment is uh, the Brant County Power uh, sale funding that's been invested. Okay, thank you very much. Good to know that we're a, we have a big war chest. Thank you, Councillor. Um, oh, oh, the names are all mixed up. I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Councillor Miller, you're next. Councillor Pierce, you've got to put your name in the right place. We've given you four years to learn. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, through to Cam. Cam, uh, I, I want to pick your uh, the accounting part of your brain there for this question, and it might seem a little bit odd, but there, there's a reason I'm asking it. And if I look at page four of your report, it's a consolidated statement financial position. I look at uh, financial liabilities. It says accounts payable and accrued liabilities. It's almost $23 million for 2021. So that's the money we owe. And if I look at the financial assets and accounts receivable, it's it's like half of that, 11.2 million. <laughs> um, is that right? Is is that typical? I I don't know. Maybe, do you have any opinion on that? It, if I look at that and say it sounds like the county has a lot of bills sitting there that nobody wants to cut a check for, or or, or and is there more to it? That I gotta assume there's more to it, which is why I'm asking. Yes, through the mayor. Yes, there is more to it. Uh, your, your logic isn't too far off for a regular business. You, you want to make sure your receivables are going to be funding your payables on a cash management basis. Well, you have to remember that the, the county is in the, uh, the good position is that the majority of their receivables are tax revenues, and those are pretty well all paid by the end of the year. So we see very little actual uh, tax arrears outstanding at the end of the year compared to regular operational payables. So it's completely, it's a, just a difference in the way the cash is received. Uh, we, we earn our tax revenue equally, evenly throughout the year, more or less. So <clears throat> if I could follow up. Okay, thank you <laughs> for the accounts receivable, but the accounts payable, the accrued liabilities, um, total financial liabilities, 108 million, almost 110 million, 23 million for accounts payable, accrued liabilities. Uh, I mean, you're looking at about 20%. Is that... Oh, Yes, again, through the mayor. Yeah, that's fairly consistent. You have, that's dealing with year-end payables <coughs> and adjustment. It's dealing with any other uh, capital projects that happen to be outstanding at the end of the year. So any progress certificates from engineers that are outstanding, they're all part of this payable at the end of the year. Final question. Are we accruing interest on any of that? No, these are most of these are just regular payables. So, um, uh, you know, that are due in 30 days, 60 days after the year end, regular payable. It, 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 the number looks big, but it's a, it is, it's, there's nothing that is significantly unusual except for construction-related payments that are outstanding right at the end of the year because of progress certificates. Okay, so it's not like we got $23 million sitting on the MasterCard that's just not paying it off. Okay. No. All right. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Cameron? Seeing none. Councillor Chambers. Sorry, Cameron. <laughs> uh, it's moved by myself and uh, seconded by Councillor Coleman to report uh, to the members of County Brant Council and consolidated financial statements for the year ended December 31st, 2021, be received as information. Thank you. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you again, Kim. 
Uh, 4.3 delegation is going to be Scott Johnson from the IBI group. You have 10 minutes to uh, present, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Very pleased to be here tonight in presenting this very important study. I was involved in the previous study, which was adopted in 2016, and then back to as a project manager for this uh, for this study. I can control the slides here. Tonight's presentation is about the transportation master plan update. The transportation master plan is the county's strategy for investing in roads, transit, walking, and cycling out to the year 2051. It also identifies policies and strategies for the county to manage its transportation network. The last transportation master plan was adopted in 2016, and the update accounts for new information, new growth and changes in the county, changes in travel patterns and changing priorities of the county. The TMP topics include improving efficiency and safety of all modes of travel, identifying infrastructure to support growth, addressing needs, priorities and policies for both rural and urban communities, and it relies on extensive input from public and stakeholders throughout the process. The new TMP aligns with the new official plan. The TMP was undertaken in coordination with the new OP. The TMP supports transportation related directions of the OP, providing a blueprint for transportation growth management, long term planning and funding of transportation networks. OP policies like supporting walking and cycling have been key parts of the new TMP. We are also addressing so, uh, developing solutions to traffic congestion and parking issues in downtown Paris. And we are looking to support the OP objectives of healthy and complete communities. The transportation master plan study began in late 2020 and it follows the municipal class environmental assessment process, master plan process. This is a provincially regulated process. The study was split into four phases. Phase one, needs and opportunities. Phase two, network assessment and alternative solutions. Phase three, supporting strategies. And phase four, documentation and finalization. We are now in phase four, which uh, we are planning to kick off the public review period. <laughs> Developing the TMP has involved public and stakeholder consultation. Our first round of engagement was held in March 2021. It included a public information center with the TMP webpage, display boards, a public opinion survey, an interactive map, and questions and comments. We held a stakeholder group meeting in March 2021 and also conducted Indigenous outreach. Our second round of consultation was March and April of this year. We held a live virtual public meeting and a question and comment session. We posted display boards and we collected comments from the public and held our second stakeholder engagement meeting. The TMP has produced four reports as listed here, phase one, phase two, phase three, and an engagement summary report. Plus the transportation master plan summary report, which, uh, which you've seen. This slide covers, uh, summarizes the opportunities that respond to the needs, transportation needs of the county. Uh, focusing on the text in black, meeting the needs of existing and future travel demand, improving road network safety and operations, ensuring efficient goods movement, making active transportation, that's walking and cycling, more attractive, and growing transit connections and coverage within to and from Grant. Part of the TMP was developing a new vision and goal, new vision and goals for the county's transportation system. 
The new vision statement is an inclusive multimodal transportation system that safely and reliably connects the places we live, work, and play. New TMP goals were developed and include connected communities and businesses, healthy and complete communities, a protected environment, and responsible stewardship. Now we're moving into the recommendations of the TMP. The TMP developed an extensive, included an extensive review of the road network and recommended changes to the network focused on the following. Capacity improvements to respond to growth and increased travel demand. Corridor upgrades to higher road standards to support efficient movement of cars, trucks, and transit. Strategies to improve safety and manage traffic through communities. Cycling and sidewalk improvements. We developed a short to medium term strategy to implement and improve the Paris West bypass, which we'll come back to in a minute. And we recommended a Grand River Crossing environmental assessment in the 2031 to 2041 horizon. This is a map of the road recommendations of the TMP. I don't intend to read these individually, but would be ha happy to answer questions about any projects at the end of the presentation. I would point out that project number 19 is the downtown Paris traffic study, which was a recommendation of the TMP as well. This is a map of road recommendations in the Paris area, just to carry over from the previous map, but, but providing detail if there's any questions about the individual projects recommended here. Uh, this is a map of the Paris West Bypass. An uh, important component of the TMP was developing the strategy to manage traffic through Paris through the coming years and decades. Uh, we heard a lot about concerns about congestion in the downtown and the need for the Paris East Bypass. Um, the Paris East Bypass is included in the TMP in, in as much as it is the river crossing environmental assessment that's scheduled for 2031 to 2041. The TMP develops a phased approach to manage traffic, which involves um, improving and expanding the capacity of this West Bypass route over time through the projects you can see on the map here, and eventually including the interchange at Bishopsgate Road and Highway 403. The TMP included a very comprehensive look at cycling and pedestrian active transportation. Um, the TMP developed a cycling network with some new emphasis on balancing routes that serve both transportation and recreational trips. Um, uh, the priority network provides linkages to connect communities across the county. So we looked across the county, both urban and rural, in developing the recommended cycling network. And it identifies a priority system, a priority scheme of where to focus on cycling network improvements to meet the objectives of the TMP. TMP included several directions to support public transit. Brand Transit is already doing a great job, I should say, um, studying and growing and looking at some of the strategies that were identified for the TMP, uh, but flagging a couple of key strategies. A need to assess potential and future fixed route transit service within Paris and or connecting communities within Brandt and to pilot or implement services where visible. Continue to seek partnerships with adjacent municipalities, such as Brantford Transit, to provide or improve transit connections. For example, the county is currently partnering with Brantford Transit to pilot a service for employment areas near Paris, and to assess the viability of providing access to the Brantford train station for connections between Paris and Via Rail. Finally, provincial partnerships, including continuing to participate with the province in developing an interregional bus terminal, for example, Go Transit, with a park and ride facility at Highway 403 and Rest Acres Road, 
and to advocate for the inclusion of Paris in the province's planned Brantford Cambridge Kitchener Waterloo Regional Bus Service. Last slide. The TMP developed a wide range of supporting strategies to improve transportation. These include strategies for complete streets, improving functional road classification, on-street parking, new mobility. New mobility refers to connected autonomous vehicle and electrified vehicles. Paris bypass strategy, as I mentioned. New modernized street cross sections, accounting for complete streets. Sidewalks, speed limits, in particular, uh, a recommendation to consider decreasing the statutory speed limit to 40 kilometers per hour. Traffic calming, gravel road conversion, bridge management, including that low use bridges nearing the end of their lifespan may be considered for closure or conversion to active transportation, and travel demand management. Thank you, would be pleased to answer any questions. Thank you for the presentation. Are there any questions directed to the presenter, knowing that this is going to come forward later on in a report in 9.3? So any questions that the presenter can answer before you might choose to leave? Councillor Miller and then Councillor Wheat. A couple of questions. Uh, three to the presenter. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, you looked at roads. Did you did you also look at intersections and any intersections that we should be improving? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. The transportation master plan is a strategic document, and it tends to focus at the airplane level view of the county. Um, and a number of corridors were looked at as part of the TMP that resulted in the recommendations for the road network. Um, in terms of individual intersections, the TMP generally does not go into specifics such as turn and movement concerns, queue lengths, signal timing, signal warrants, uh, topics like that. Okay, so the, the one I have in mind is um, Highway 2 slash King Edward goes through Paris, <laughs> curves, but then there's Dumfries Street that goes to the left. It's where the old Kentucky Fried Chicken used to be. It's, it's a really awkward intersection. I just thought, I just I was really hoping you guys would have a solution for that one. So, but, uh, okay. Um, you talked about uh, roads, Highway 24, uh, Bethel to Colburn Street West. Um, how easy is it to go about improving a provincial highway for a municipality in your experience? Generally, when it comes to Provincial highways, of course, they're the, under the authority of MTO, so the county and the TMP could have a very important role in being an advocate for changes. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, um, it's through separate consultation with the Ministry of Transportation. Have you dealt with the MTO? <clears throat> yes. Okay. Um, last question. I, I got more, but I'll, I'll save those for the report coming up later on. Um, you talk about maybe getting rid of some low-use bridges. Obviously, there's other factors we would have to consider, and you, you laid them out, road alternatives, network impacts, impacts cost, adjacent land. Um, is there a definition for low-use bridge, or is your definition uh, would be might be different from mine? Is, or is, is there a textbook um, definition for that so that you guys use? My firm does have experience with this question through various municipalities, and different municipalities do tend to set different thresholds. Um, we've heard thresholds as low as 40 vehicles per day or as high as 400 vehicles per day. Um, the TMP as a strategic plan is intended to provide a first notice of the bridges that might be considered for closure in the county, but it is not the final word. The TMP recommends that staff consult further and look at further details such as um, the topic that you are, you're raising. Yeah, okay, because I see there's nine in our ward. I'm sorry? There's nine bridges in our ward, which I thought was a little bit high. So I would definitely, uh, I'm going to have to do some digging on that one. So, okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Wheat, you're next. <clears throat> thank you. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to the presenter. And I'll bring this up again under 9.3. Um, I'm really not picking on you. Just a suggestion when you're looking at trails for cycling and walking, bearing in mind when you get out in the country, you're bordering on agricultural fields, farmers fields, 
And um, I would suggest that you consult with them and let them know what you're doing so that the, they don't phone me yesterday to know why this is happening against their, uh, against their field. Because a lot of cycling and unfortunately walking trails, garbage ends up in the farmer's field. Through you, Mr. Mayor, thank you for the comment. The, uh, and I appreciate that concern. The TMP is not a final approval to construct the trails in the rural parts of the county or in the urban parts. And um, funding for those projects would come through the capital plan and council approval um, in over, over, over the course of the planning horizon of the TMP. Thank you. Council Ferrier, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I will save some for 9.3 as well, but I do have some that I think can be addressed here in terms of information. Um, I appreciate the, the TMP having a lot on cycling, pedestrian use, and public transportation. Um, I, I think you'd agree, I hope, that, that um, when it comes to partnerships around public transportation, that was something that I think was easily slowed when transit took such a hit uh, during the last two years with COVID where you had some transit systems who operate traditional buses, et cetera, unlike our tr uh, transit system, taking you know, millions of dollars of hits in medium-sized communities. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that's something that we would already be um, connected on um, with the city of Brantford had it not been uh, for COVID. Um, my question though is about, my first one, and I have another one after, is about the speed limit reduction and the efficacy, the efficacy of such. Um, I know in Hamilton, they, they did at the beginning of this term a 40 kilometer an hour reduction uh, in urban zones and in, in populated zones. Um, do you have any idea about how, how it's actually worked in the communities that have done so? And do you know of any small urban slash rural communities that have done so? This is a very good question through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, it is true that simply lowering the speed limits doesn't result in an equivalent reduction in traffic speeds. So uh, reducing the speed limit on a rural county road from 80 kilometers an hour to 70 kilometers an hour may not be reflected in a 10 kilometer an hour reduction in average traffic speeds. Mm -hmm. However, there is a component of the population that does follow the speed limit and the reduction of a speed limit does encourage um, potentially encourages speeders to reduce their speed somewhat as well. So instead of going 60 in a 50 zone, they might be going 50 in a 40 zone. Um, because of those benefits, it is a strategy that is seen as viable for, for municipalities. And uh, towards the consultation we did in this TMP, we heard a lot about safety from the public, mm -hmm. a lot of concerns, and that was a central focus of the public comments on the TMP. And one of the reasons that that strategy made it, made it in. Thank you. And one more, if I can, Your Worship, uh, through you to the speaker. Um, the speed limit reduction piece is interesting because also I think one thing that maybe isn't mentioned is that um, police fines then go up as well, which is a deterrent in, in many areas. And we have a lot of uh, police enforcement actually currently. Um, my, my question is about bridges, uh, especially one that would be a, a bypass over the Grand River, which would have, you know, you, you don't recommend an environmental study until no sooner than 2031. Um, can you put a little color on that? And can you also um, explain to us and the public at home how the process is for cost sharing something like that? Because when I think about that, I think $100 million, and I think about things like affordable housing partnerships with the province and the feds where getting a third and a third is pulling teeth like you wouldn't believe and jumping through hoops. I also think when we look at those things, we end up seeing in this case, we would also need the province to allow us to add it to our developmental charges. How could that happen? I, I just to give you a little, I, I was at a meeting once about developmental charges where we were raising them by $100 million, and a developer said something to the effect of, great, well, once the bridge is done, though, well, they go back down. And our manager, <laughs> general manager, had to say, that's not for the bridge. That's for all the other developmental charges. We aren't even allowed to charge for the bridge now. So I was wondering if you could maybe comment on that because that's not in the report so much. Sure, so the uh, the Paris East bypass was uh, an important focus or important part of the study. And um, also 
part of the task of the team was to um, consolidate the recommendations of the road network against the goals of the TMP, which one of which included responsible stewardship and uh, managing the funding. And the recommendations of the TMP, if you look through the road network recommendations, there is quite an extensive list of road improvements for the next 10 years. And therefore, the affordability question is an important part of the TMP. Um, whereas, and your number is probably not far off, we haven't done an estimate, but uh, a, a new river crossing is a major, major undertaking. Um, and the affordability question for the county would be a, an important part of that. So part of the strategy of the TMP was, first of all, to acknowledge the concerns that the public have raised about congestion in the downtown. Um, we're not brushing those aside by any means. In fact, acknowledging that it is a problem that needs to be dealt with at some point in the future but taking the phased approach uh, uh, in terms of more affordable planning over the coming 10 to 20 years uh, on the West Bypass to help manage traffic over time. Uh, when it comes to funding the project itself, uh, under, I agree that the, uh, the approach for most municipalities would be to seek external funding, um, and that could be through provincial grants or federal grants. Those tend to be a little bit hard to predict. They can come somewhat randomly. Um, I, to me, a great part of the TMP is we have a nice long list of projects and completed EAs in the county that should funding become available, there are shovel-ready projects. And the 2031 to 2041 timeline for the EA uh, makes sense in the context of the recommendations of the TMP. Uh, even the EA is a big undertaking for the county. We haven't developed a cost for it, but it's a very large EA. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Councillor Bell, Councillor Bell, you're next, and then Councillor McAlpine. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you to the presenter. Uh, thank you for the report. It was one I circulated to as many people as I could so that the community would understand what's going on here. I have a question about the Paris West Bypass. Um, I can understand how you came to that conclusion. Do you have modeling that shows just what the effect will be on congestion downtown? Will it really make an impact? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Yes, we have modeling and we included modeling and it does provide a benefit. Um, speaking to the earlier point, the TMP does acknowledge that it doesn't solve all of the problems of the downtown. It will continue to be congested and um, the benefit of the West Bypass is the relief valve that's mainly accommodating growth, not necessarily accommodating existing demand through the downtown. So there will still be congestion through the downtown. If I may, Mr. Mayor, um, I would really appreciate if you could share that modeling with us. I, I find it very interesting. But you, you hit on a point that I think is really uh, germane to the whole discussion. Uh, you said that a Western Bypass will not cure congestion downtown. So I, I'm of the opinion that uh, delaying the assessment of a bridge till 2031 to 2041 is uh, pushing away, pushing it far too long into the future. But more importantly, I think we're not interested in whether we have a bridge or not. We're interested in whether we can cure congestion. So are you telling me that the only possible way of curing congestion is a bridge? Because that's a very big statement, and I, I would actually like to see a more evidence that there aren't other ways of addressing congestion other than a bridge. Thank you, through you, Mr. Mayor. That's a great question. And I should clarify that the recommendation for the EA is not a recommendation to develop a new bridge or a new East Bypass. We've actually softened that language in the TMP to say that the EA would need to look at various strategies to address the through traffic problem of downtown Paris and the, through, the strategies may include a new bridge. They may also include widening of the existing bridge or other strategies to help manage traffic through the downtown. So that, that general concept has been captured in the TMP. Yeah. Uh, if I may, just one last comment. Then the, the terminology we use, which is, which is Grand River Crossing Environmental Assessment, maybe we ought to rename that into how do we manage congestion in Paris. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor McAlpine, please. I think I may be partially answered by John's question and statement earlier, but the, um, there's a proposed cycling path that's going to go between Watts Pond 
and Drumble Road possibly. And the, we did have some concerned people about it, that they're abutting neighbors and stuff like that. And just trying to get a context of a timeline you're thinking of doing that and uh, public engagement in, in regards to that. I don't have a specific timeline. This, this, the strategy is a long-term strategy for what the network would look like in the 2051 horizon. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can't answer a specific timeline question. Um, so. Okay, that's what I thought. Thanks. Thank you. Councillor Chambers, you're next. And just to note that Councillor Gatward does have her hand up oh. prior, so she was before me if you want to go to her. Uh, Councillor Gatward, you're next, please. Thank you, um, Councillor Chambers and Mayor Bailey. Um, yeah, I'm, I'd like to um, talk about the improved efficiency and safety. Uh, you mentioned that in the um, slides and that um, the blueprint for transportation, growth management, long-term planning and funding of transportation networks. Um, we had several letters from residents in the Oak Hill area regarding the Highway 53 and Forest Road and Pleasant Ridge Road intersection, which is four lanes. And when I talked previously with our general manager about that area, he said they were considering perhaps in the future a roundabout there. I do not see anything in the master transportation plan about that. And currently on the corner of Pleasant Ridge and 53 to the east, the city of Brantford is in the process of having a 200 plus subdivision go in there uh, for homes. Um, they're bulldozing in there now. And the county side of that Highway 53 over in Oak Hill area, there's three subdivisions. Uh, one is just being built now, the other two haven't been started. And the letters we get from the residents, they want improved, an improved intersection, whatever that might look like. I believe the city of Grant for three negotiations on that big subdivision, the city, we did get $200,000 in funding from the city for the intersection improvements. Was that considered during the master transportation plan, that area? Thank you for the question. I believe, uh, Mark, can you help me with the answer to that one? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, that project is already currently in the short-term forecast budget for us to, to look at, and we're just waiting on additional development. So I don't think it being included was, it may have been missed to just include as a as an existing project, but we've already, it's already cons under consideration by staff to go forward with it sometime in the near future. Oh, do you know what year? Uh, it will not be in 2023, it could be 2024, 2025. So it's, it's, it's coming, it's just not, it will not be next year. Okay, thank you. And perhaps my next question is the same, um, same thing then. Um, Cockshit Road, we all know, is a very busy corridor in the county. And at the corner of Cockshit Road and County Road 18 and Phelps Road, it's a really busy intersection, sometimes quite crazy in the mornings because I go there and see it. And at one time, the director of roads told me they wanted to expand the southeast corner lane coming off Cockshit onto County Road 18 because we all know the tanker trucks are getting bigger and double tanker trucks that have trouble navigating around some of our corners. And one day I was there at that corner and had to back up to let a truck go around the corner. I was just fortunate there was no vehicles behind me. Now maybe the tanker truck trucker didn't know how to drive properly to get around the corner. 
Um, but is is that intersection scheduled for anything then in the near future? Because it isn't on the list either. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Clarkshire Road was identified in the TMP as corridor improvements pro, uh, for for the purposes of the TMP, and uh, we we actually worked with the county on the short term improvements that uh, are under construction now uh, as part of the TMP, um, which to me is a great proactive look at the safety improvements along the corridor, doing what we can in the short term with the resurfacing of the road. And looking at the long term, the TMP does recommend that the county go through the corridor in a more comprehensive look and potentially ins uh, upgrade the intersections further, considering options such as roundabouts and traffic signals. So it is in the TMP for improvements, and we're pleased that there are already short term improvements being made in the corridor. Yeah, yes, I, I um, didn't know if I could comment on the on that or not, but um, the existing um, surfacing that they've just done is wonderful. And I appreciate the turning lane um, at the Little Brown Cow because there's been um, lots of near misses there. And when it's a high speed road, um, bad things can happen. So um, yeah, kudos to you and our staff for um, making those improvements on on the cockshit road i was just down it today and that's all i had uh, mr mayor thank you thank you councillor got word uh, councillor chambers and then councillor coleman please uh thank you uh mr mayor uh and through you to the presenters uh you had mentioned earlier that the transportation master plan is a high level uh, document so i'm going to take us back to the high level uh, away from the uh, localized issues, if, if I might. And it, it's a, a philosophical document, so this is a philosophical question that you can uh, answer. Um, and it's a two-part philosophical question. It doesn't take a genius to, to realize that there's a difference in transportation in urban areas and rural areas. And Brant County being uh, a municipality that has a rural area and an urban area, you may wish to comment how you meld the two and address the issues of both, uh, uh, not independent of each other, but uh, intertwined with each other. And then you can take that to the next step, knowing that our area, Brant County is um, the, the donut uh, around the city, highly urban area of Brantford, and Brantford has to get out so they have to get through Brant County. And if you look at the other, uh, Brant County is, is the, the donut, but on the outside of the donut, you have rural uh, municipalities, Norfolk, Oxford, uh, rural uh, Waterloo region, and rural Hamilton. So the transportation is a, is a mixture of rural urban uh, issues. And I'm just wondering if you can explain perhaps to me and to everybody else for that matter, on how you meld rural urban uh, transportation issues locally and globally. Thank you for the question through you, Mr. Mayor. Um, part of the TMP development has been um, a, a strong focus on making sure that all issues are heard, all concerns are heard, including rural and urban issues. And um, as part of the stakeholder consultation that was done it, or public and stakeholder consultation that was done, in particular the first phase of the TMP, was about collecting from, um, from all parts of the county the input on the needs of the transportation system. So in our engagement summary report, we have specified specifically how we've listened to the rural um, parts of the county and the urban parts of the county. Uh, so I believe we can show with evidence that we have heard all voices and developed recommendations that speak to both the rural, the rural and the urban parts of the county. Um, when it comes to the city of Brantford, um, they, the city participated in our stakeholder consultation and we held a couple of meetings earlier on. This 
for example, we talked about Canesville. Uh, we talked about the uh, city, the airport uh, development on the west end of the city and the south end and ensuring that our transportation system matches up with the cities. Um, there is, of course, future work to do in terms of coordination with the city on the individual roads and projects that could cross municipal boundary lines. Um, and then finally, on the, on the third point, the external municipalities, they too were consulted with. Folk, Oxford, Hamilton were, uh, were part of our stakeholder consultation. We got great input from them, uh, including which resulted in changes and recommendations of the TNP. Um, Drumbo Road, for example, we extended that project to the Oxford County line so that it's in response to a question from them or a request from, from them. So um, I believe we've uh, really made a great effort in terms of outreach and and hearing from all parties as part of the TMP development and developed a very balanced plan um, in response. Councillor Coleman and then Councillor Howes, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, to you to the presenter, I uh, appreciate your report. Very, very thoroughly done. Um, my concern is, is and, and, and you answered partial of my question uh, through Councillor Chambers, um, City of Brantford. We know that they have uh, pulled the plug so far on, on the Oak Hill Expressway and crossing the Grand River. So that traffic has got to go two ways. Got to go out through 53, which is Ward 5, and head towards Rest Acres Road, which is part of Ward 5. And then the other way will be Phelps Road, County Road 18, which is Ward 5. So what assurances have you can I get to my residents that how we're going to deal with this traffic? Thank sure. you. Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, the city and the county have reinitiated the joint transportation review. Uh, so, like your concerns will be addressed through that process. Not necessarily, and we've tried to address as much as we can through the TMP, but there's that committee is starting up again, and what you're asking about will be taken care of through that. Follow up when? Through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we've had an initial meeting, and another meeting I think is to happen in November and then continue from there. So once we actually have something, we'll be able to report back to council where what direction we're going. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Councillor House. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, I do have some detailed questions, which I'll save for later um, in the 9.3 section. But I, I have a fundamental question for the consultant: the uh, is is a transportation master plan uh, a living plan that 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 evolves and continues. And, and the reason I ask is because hearing the words, there will still be congestion downtown, says to me that we're not done. Um, so if you could please speak to that. And if you could also please speak to the, uh, your, your presentation references the fact that there will be a public engagement period starting in November. If you could speak a little bit to the mechanics of that. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, and through you, Mr. Mayor, um, for the public engagement period, so the plan is to post our materials online for public review. That is part of the uh, MCEA process, the regulated process, and it goes to public review for, uh, for 30 days. And so that is the intent for the coming weeks. Um, in response to your first question about uh, congestion and whether the TMP is a living document, the answer is yes, it is a living document. The MCEA, the Act, requires municipalities to consider an update of the TMP at the time of the OP updates or every five years, whichever comes first. And the county has been meeting this requirement through the TMP update. The last one was held in 2016, uh, and this is the current update. So it will be revisited again in five to seven years as part of the next update, and that provides the opportunity to, uh, to do a check-in on how the county is doing, how it's progressing towards the goals, um, how the county is implementing the recommendations for roads, transit, 
active transportation and to revisit those key topics and ask if any of those recommendations need to change. Should certain road projects be pushed further out, perhaps growth isn't as fast as it was anticipated, or should projects be brought in earlier? So in, uh, in five to seven years, that to those topics do come up again as part of the next TMP update. Yep. Thank you. Follow up, Mr. Mayor? Um, through you. Uh, thanks for the answer, although um, not good news, I don't think, in the sense if, 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 if the words there will still be congestion downtown are part of this plan, I don't think we can wait five to seven years to review. Um, so we can discuss this further later on. I, I do have a, a short answer, which is the, um, the goals and objectives of the TMP, the plan that we have, reflect the consultation that we did as part of the TMP. And um, the goals are more extensive and wide ranging than simply addressing congestion. And I think that's a very important point to make because we heard from the public about congestion, but we also heard a lot about safety, uh, a, a lot of interest in cycling, um, transit and improving sustainable transportation. So the TMP, the objective is to take a balanced approach to all of those uh, objectives and it, I believe it accomplishes that. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you for your, uh, for your report. Um, I'm now looking for a motion to receive this delegation and refer it to 9.3. The master plan report. Seeking a motion. Councillor Bell, or Councillor Pierce, seconded by Councillor Ferrier. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Thank you. 4.4 4 is a petition submitted by John Waters on truck traffic on Maple Avenue. This came through uh, Councillor Miller. There is no delegation. Um, really, do you want to speak to it, uh, Councillor Miller? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, there's a few things uh, John has addressed in the letter. It's quite a few things. Um, but the speed Greg Demers is working on it through Brant Safe Streets. Uh, increased big traffic, big rig traffic on Maple Lab. I'm not sure we're going to get away from that, but as far as I'm turning on the side streets, uh, Heather Boyd is working on that <laughs> with IT, whether she knows it or not. <laughs> and then uh, the last thing, what I would like um, is regarding the safety of school children crossing at an intersection. So, uh, Mr. Mayor, I'm going to make a motion, hopefully I get a second, um, and just simply asking uh, staff to look into um, is a um, school crossing warranted on Maple Ave? Uh, we do have one on uh, King, King Street, uh, the other one going through Burford, so, um, but we don't have one on Maple Ave. We have the school just a uh, block off of Maple Ave, so um, I'm just wondering if it is warranted, and I would need staff to look into that for us. So I'm seeking a seconder on that one. Seeking a seconder. Councillor Bell, is there any other discussion? Just, just one. D didn't last week, last week we were chatting about, don't we need a, a to waive notice of motion first? Don't we need a motion on the waiving of the notice of motion? Through yeah, you to clear. the clerk? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, this is an item on the agenda. Uh, there was no recommended motion. If Councillor Miller would like to make a motion to refer to staff, I believe that would be in order. Wonderful. I just wanted to make sure we weren't stepping over lines. Thank you. It's on the floor. It has a seconder. Are there any other questions? So it's direction to staff to investigate whether the crosswalk is warranted. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. 4.5, oh Dave, to delegate the Sony Homes, welcome. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor. That, I wasn't quite the welcoming us for my first time in the council chambers. But You're always welcome. I, uh, I do appreciate the opportunity uh, to be here this evening and um, really the last council meeting. So just I, I appreciate all the councillors that uh, have worked with over the last number of years and and wish those uh, continuing to run all the best in the upcoming election. So I'm here this evening in response to uh, the, the committee meeting, planning committee meeting, 
where uh, we had suggested that at the request or in response to comments with regard to parking on site and additional parking that we would go away and take a look at an opportunity to uh, add some additional parking to the site uh, even though really the lands were meeting the required uh, parking under the current bylaw. And we had a positive uh, recommendation from county staff in support of the site plan. We have had a chance to take a look at the site plan. We have increased parking spaces on the site. And the plan that you see now has 35 visitor parking spaces nine more than required by the bylaw, or 35% more than required. So this evening I'm just here requesting that uh, council consider the staff recommendation and support the staff recommendation to uh, support the site plan based on this modified plan uh, so that it can be move forward to be finalized and that uh, this housing can be brought forward uh, to the market to address the housing needs, not just in the county, but throughout the province. And I'd be happy to answer any questions on the revised plan. Thank you, Dave. Are there any questions for Dave? Councillor Bell, you're first. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for you today. Um, welcome, Dave. Um, can I ask if you gave consideration to a number of alternatives that would have led to more or less parking spaces? And, and I just want to give you a, a piece of my experience having walked around the sites very close to this subdivision, which are actually Lozani properties and it happens. Um, my observation is that 50% of the people that own those homes do not use their garages for parking cars, and neither could they, because those garages are filled with things, stuff. Um, so if, with this 101 um, dwelling development, half of those people don't use their garages, then we have to accommodate 50 cars somewhere. Um, tell me how you would accommodate those 50 cars Bearing in mind that we shouldn't be using visitor car parking spaces as overflow residential because they're there for a very specific purpose, which is for visitors. Uh, so I'd appreciate your, your thoughts on that. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, I'm, from a planning perspective, I won't comment on the use of garages and how people use their, their private spaces. What I can comment on is the requirements associated with planning and site planning and what we need to consider in context of planning applications and considerations for site plan approvals. Those are your official plan providing direction on uses and permissions and your zoning bylaw that establishes regulations and requirements for considerations. That's what we've done. We've provided a plan that meets the requirements. We've provided a plan that's been reviewed by county staff in all aspects, engineering, waste, fire, planning, landscape. And what's being proposed is a plan that's being recommended by staff that's in accordance with your policies, bylaws, and regulations. A uh, quick follow-up if I may, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Dave, you are quite correct uh, in terms of your analysis relative to our rule set. Uh, I'm just trying to reflect the reality of life out there in that subdivision. And we are going to compound uh, an existing problem, add to it, and I think if we don't make some change, and, and bearing in mind that Lozani are planning to build additional subdivisions to the both the north and the south, uh, we are going to be left with a very large problem. And that is why I think recognizing that the letter of the law you are within, but the spirit of development and, and um, working with uh, the county to get a good solution for our community 
I think what you're suggesting and offering is falling far short of what is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Councillor Ferrier next, and then Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm, I'm going to take a different tact uh, through you, there, Dave. Um, I, I want to say thank you, first of all, for exceeding the exceeding that you had done previously. You had had two exceeded spaces to the bylaw, and you've added seven more for a total of nine more, exceeding the requirement. Um, my question, and, and maybe you'll choose to answer this offline or in an email one day. Uh, and you know, I'm I, I'm not captain pro development here, so uh, I don't think any developer is going to ever offer me a job, but. Um, I do want to say well done when it is warranted. Um, was getting an increase from um, the developer here, was that difficult or maybe you'd like to answer that in a different way of giving us insights into how to get concessions like this without having to go through tribunals where we would lose, to be frank. Um, yeah, do you have any insight on that? Because in the package we have a legal letter from the developer about, you know, you, you approve what we put out there or, or else, um, but this is, much better than that letter. So, you know, can you talk about how we can do more of that? Any insight on that? I, I think it's, my comment would be is the base is, all, there's always the bylaws and the regulations that, that are the standards uh, that, you know, we as planners or as developers look to for guidance and direction to start there. Uh, and then that's a plan that's bought brought forward, it goes through a review process and and changes occur and plans evolve um, over time and 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 process really, uh, those things just happen. I think in this case, uh, you know, based on the last discussion, we wanted to come back uh, to this council. We wanted an opportunity to bring something forward that we thought would, you know, be considered and hopefully approved. Uh, and so when I suggested that leave, uh, leave that with us, give us some opportunity, we went back to see what we could find. I think it's really nothing more than that. It's um, you know a, a willing developer to take a look at this and respond to requests within the context of knowing that what was put forward uh, met the regulations and just looking to try and find a way to come to uh, a solution in the council chambers rather than outside of them. And if I can have a follow-up, uh, Your Worship, um, through you to Dave. Um, is something like having ample visitor parking and ample parking, full-size garages, things we've talked about before, are those marketable to the buyer? I know these will sell anyway, everything you guys have built has sold, but does that actually help? Because I know when I was looking at condos, you know, three times in my life and buying two different ones. You know, they tell you, make sure you look at the reserves, make sure you look at the condo fees. You don't want them too high, but you don't want them too low. But they never, in any magazine, any article, any real estate agent, they don't really talk to you about visitor parking and parking dynamics in these sort of condo areas. So does that, does something like this actually help with the sellability? Um, I don't know. I'm not really into the marketing. It could be something I could find out. Uh, I, I've never seen a marketing brochure that says, you know, we have extra parking spaces. Usually, usually they talk about square footages and finishes and those types of things. Well, maybe after people have lived in condos without uh, ample parking, they, they will look at the next time and say, actually, you know what, maybe that's a good idea. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Pierce, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Three of you to Dave. And, and Dave, again, as I said at the last of the, the planning meeting, appreciate you guys going away and, and taking another look at this because the reality is, as has been stated a few times and as you've stated, as far as the regulations are concerned, you guys were within it at the planning meeting, you were actually exceeded it and now you've exceeded it more. So again, I appreciate that. Um, if I can be so blunt as to say that I've knocked on every door up there as part of my campaign and I'm not kidding you when I say at least, at least 70% of the people in that subdivision are beyond tired of, of the parking issues. And I ex try to explain to them the fact that, you know, within the standards that you're working with, you are actually exceeding it and, and go through the whole thing about the garages and all that. Again, we can't, we can't demand or, or make people use their garages to park in. The reality is 
it's not being done. Yet. The reality is, even if it is being done, as I said, there's multiple cars within a family nowadays. So as much as, like I say, as much as you're, you're within the regulations, um, and, and I'll, use the, I'll use the phrases, yes, this, this plan has met the regulations and exceeded the regulations, but unfortunately it hasn't met reality. And I'll leave it at that. But again, I appreciate you doing what you did. Thank you. Councillor, how is your next, please? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, through you. And, and this, this is a tricky situation because I fully empathize with, with the councillors from Ward 3 who are trying to fix a problem. And it's, it's not just a Ward 3 problem, it's a problem in, that we're all going to experience in other areas where there's subdivisions. But as somebody who deals with municipalities in my day job, I, I also respect the fact that, that in different categories, there's a rule book. And you either meet the rules, or you exceed the rules, or or you don't meet the rules. And, and in this case, um, to, to to exceed the rules by nine additional parking spaces, um, I have to say, I think is is a is a a solid gesture on on the part of of, of the the applicant. And I I think our our problem is not with this this application i think our problem is with our rule book I, th I think that's the, the the bigger picture i i empathize with the with um someone who is trying to comply with the rules that the municipality has has put forward and and exceeded them so um just very tricky situation but i just wanted to put that context on it thank you thank you are there any other questions to the presenter Seeing none, I'm looking for a motion to receive this uh, delegation and to refer it to 9.1, please. Councillor Miller, Councillor Coleman. One comment? One comment, sure. Yeah, just a comment, not a question, but um, I, I would like to, to know and, and say in, in my way of, um, we must be doing something right. When we started this term, most of the time when we had developers come, they were asking us to cut a couple of spots and, and you know uh, do, do them a solid in terms of, uh, having less spots than the bylaw um, and waiving that. Um, I, I noticed about a year in, we started having developers come saying we've met or exceeded, um, and we've been very firm about um, developments that could have been very prosperous in many ways, not uh, wanting to follow the parking bylaw and us saying no. So um, again, it's it's just something to keep in mind in the larger scope of things. We must be doing something right that developers are now coming to us exceeding the expectation, even if there are issues with the expectation versus the reality. Thank That's you all. for the comment. Any other comments? Seeing none, it's on the floor. It has a seconder. All those in favor? Opposed? Thanks, Dave. And thank you for listening to us. <clears throat> Which takes us to item five on the agenda, uh, the adoption of the minutes of the previous meeting, please. Councillor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Move by myself, second by Councillor Goward, that the County of Grant Council minutes of September 27, 2022 be approved. Okay, all those in favor? Opposed, carried. Is there any business arising from the minutes? Seeing none, we'll continue on with the consent items to be approved, which there aren't any. Consent items to be received. There are some. Does you, Councillor Miller wants to separate some, or do you want to go through them all? Uh, no, a 7.2.4. 7.2.4, separate it. Any others? Councillor Wheat? No, I have it to move it. Oh, okay. So we're going to move everything but 7.2.4. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried? Councillor Miller, if you'd like to speak to 7.2.4. Yeah, the Brantman of Song, um, you read the letter, you know they've been around for many, many decades. Um, I think they represent our area very well. Um, they're looking for some support. Uh, my question to you, Mr. Mayor, is do we still have some funds left in our community? Cool. I believe we do, Councillor Miller. I'm not sure how much. Who knows how much we have left in the grants? Who might know? Heather, no. Heather Boyd? Um, there would be enough to cover any of these sponsorship levels. That's, that would be fine. Thank, thank you. Are there, is there a recommendation from council as to what they 
would like to support Councilor Miller? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll move the platinum amount. Sorry, I'm looking for a second here. And I guess that Councilor Coleman. Is there any other discussion on the amount of the sponsorship? Say none, we'll call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried, thank you. Which takes us to 8.1. My piles are lining up here beautifully. <laughs> I like when that happens. Uh, the planning and development, <laughs> don't do that. The Planning and Development Committee report of uh, September the 6th, Councillor Bell. Um, I think Councillor Week would like to make a oh, statement. Uh, Councillor Week. Uh, yes, I might, through you, Mr. Mayor, before Councillor Bell, the Chair of Planning, presents his report. I'd like to stand and apologize to the people of that, uh, that I offended at that meeting, Mayor Bailey, Mayor Howes, or Member Howes, Member McAlpine, and Member Gatward. My apologies if I offended you at that meeting. I sincerely apologize to you before Councillor Bell, Chairman Bell, presents his planning report. Thank you, Councillor Wheat. Councillor Bell, want to respond to that? Yes. Um, it was brought to my attention that there was an issue, and I'm very grateful to Councillor Wheat for dealing with this in this way. I appreciate his apology. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on then to your report. Yeah, um, Planning and Development Committee report for September <coughs> the 6th. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Miller, that the Planning and Development Committee report of September the 6th, 2022 be approved. Are there any questions to Councillor Bell on his report? <coughs> Seeing none, call the vote to receive the report. All those in favor? <coughs> Report of September the 13th, 2022, be approved. Thank you. Are there any questions to Councillor McAlpine on his report? 8.2. Call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. We're going to go to 8.3 Administration and Operations Committee report of September the 20th. Councillor Pierce, that's yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Howes that the Administration and Operations Committee report of September 20th uh, be approved, noting there's nine recommendations. Nine recommendations. Are there any questions to Councillor Pierce? Seeing none, all those in favor? Thank you. Paramedic Services Committee, that's Councillor Ferrier. Thank you. Moved by myself and seconded by my friend, Councillor Pierce, who sits on that committee as well, that the Paramedic Services Committee minutes of August 8th, 2022 and September 6th, 2022 be received as information and that the draft 2023 Paramedic Services budget, being the committee recommendation of the budget, be received as information and delivered as well to the City of Brantford as provided for in the budget process of the Paramedic Services Agreement as amended. Thank you, Councillor. Everyone understands what he's just said. It's going to be carried forward to the budget. Okay, knowing that, all those in favor? Opposed, it's carried. Thank you, Mark. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Miller. What? I'm trying to keep my eye on Councillor Gatward. See. <laughs> She's a problem. Uh, just a question I could, if, if I could, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Um, just on the budget itself, um, my understanding, when I was reading it, we hadn't got an update from the province on their contribution yet. Have, have today's... Uh, September 27th, have we heard anything? So so we did have an update at the meeting regarding COVID funding and that being something that we're going to see for the future. We also um, had an amendment for the budgetary piece and the 50% funding is confirmed as well. But I don't know if there's anything since then. I'd have to pass that through you, Mr. Mayor, CEO Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Yeah, through, through you, Mr. Chair. So we have received notice of our 2022 funding from the province finally, finally noting that they will pr provide 50% of uh, funding for last year's budget. What they won't be providing is an inflationary increase for this year's budget. Uh, this has been an ongoing problem. This is what we spoke to the province about. So, so at this point, you know, we were hoping that the province would start adding some inflationary increases to, uh, to, to you know, current year budget and providing some confidence we'd have some inflationary increases for future year budgets. We aren't seeing that at this point. Can I just add, Mr. Mayor, by, by way of context through you to Councillor Miller, um, that 
the budget, the draft budget as approved was actually the base budget with an additional, some enhancements to staffing and ambulance. Um, what we didn't approve uh, or disapprove of is the decision packages otherwise. So there's room in the budget still to get sort of a fulsome view for the next council and the next committees, or I should say the next councils and the next committees. Okay, thank you. And, and the reason I'm asking about the budget is because, yeah, we did make that present, that delegation, and hopefully they hear it loud and clear because, well, it's frustrating when <laughs> they accuse the feds of not covering their costs for health care, but they'll turn around to the municipalities and do the exact same thing. So very frustrating to watch, especially when you're on the receiving end. So, okay. And as someone who also sits on that committee too, it was well received by the city. Uh, so I don't think it's going to be a problem at all. It's just a matter of receiving our final figures, and I think it's going to be fine when it gets to budget. Thank you for all your hard work. Number nine. Oh, did we? Did, we did vote. Okay, we're in number nine. Then. Staff reports. Nine one. A site plan control application block. 97 Mile Hill Phase 2, the Edgar subdivision. Councillor Miller, you have that? Yes, Mr. Mayor, and I will put it on the floor, I guess. Um, moved by myself, second by Councillor Chambers. Um, and I'll just present, uh, well, it's the site plan control application block 97 Mile Hill Phase 2, which is the Edgar subdivision. And just to refresh the, the Council's memory, this was referred from the Planning and Development. So uh, what the motion is, that site plan control application from Dave Aspen of MHBC Planning on behalf of Losani Homes, owner of lands legal, legally known as Plan 2M1956, Block 57, municipally known as 1067 Rest Acres Road, geographic town of Paris, County of Brant, proposing to develop the sub subject lands with a common element condominium consisting of 101 three-story residential row house units to be approved and that the reason for the approvals are as follows. The application provides for compatible land use representing an appropriate application of the general community and urban design policies. The application conforms to the policies of the County of Brant official plan and complies with the provisions of zoning bylaw 61-16. And the application conforms to the policies of the growth plan for the greater Golden Horseshoe and is consistent with the policies of the provincial policy statement. Thank you. We have it on the floor. It is seconded. Uh, is there any discussion? Councillor Bell, you're first. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, well, following on from what Dave Aston uh, shared with us earlier, uh, I would like to say that the, 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 site, um, the site plan control document, I think, is very well done. I mean, it, it, in total, it is a very good document. It addresses all the issues. The hard fact is it won't work and it won't work in regard of, of parking. And I find it very difficult to be supportive of something that I know will compound and exacerbate an existing problem. And I will not be able to support this. I don't know where that takes us in terms of um, uh, coming into conflict with the um, uh, developer. I would like to think that developers can see that yes, they have to meet the minimum standards. That does not mean that they can't exceed those minimum standards. And I think given the particular role that Lozani plays as a developer in Rest Acres Road, both north and south of this site, they will be, they have the ability, if they work, were willing to work with the county to make a difference to this sub subdivision. And I think that we are, I, I'm saddened by the fact that they don't see that opportunity, especially given that, that Lozani are a major developer elsewhere in the county in the Nif Peninsula, they're going to be a major developer in uh, St. George. I think it would have been appropriate for them to just step back and say, as the major developer in this area, we should set a good example. We should play our part as a good corporate citizen and make life for everybody in that, that community better than it is today. We will be inundated with parking issues. If you want to make a positive out of it, uh, if we apply our parking bylaws, we will make an awful lot of money out of it. But that's not the way I want to see life. I want to see that our residents in that subdivision are satisfied with the home that they've bought and the land around them and their neighbours. And we are running into situations where people can't park anywhere near their home, so they park near some neighbour's home. Then the problem just transmits from one location to another and it becomes 
a, a perennial problem unless we take uh, firm action now and create a solution that will work for the whole of that development, not just particularly for this this particular subdivision. So I'm I'm I understand where where um, Lozani come from in legal terms. I think in moral terms, in in working with us in the community, I think they're fair. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Anyone else want to speak to this? Councillor Chambers and then Councillor Ferrier. Yeah, just uh, a, a couple comments, and I appreciate what uh, Councillor Bell has said, and, and no doubt there will be problems. I wish people would clean out the garages and park in the garage where they're supposed to, but uh, that having been said, I just wanted to make comment on, on the process of uh, uh, the site plan uh, approval process, and this obviously was uh, site plans have been delegated to be approved by staff, and this one was bumped up according to our uh, notwithstanding clause, which apparently is uh, going to be not uh, allowed uh, by the Planning Act uh, revision that uh, is, is before the legislature. I believe it's passed. So site plans will be approved at the staff level, not at the uh, level around the table, which I think is unfortunate because the discussion around the table did uh, help somewhat uh, to address the issue that uh, has been brought forward and, and that wouldn't have happened uh, it, um, other than we asked for a bump up and a discussion and I appreciate the developers um, working uh, with us in that respect. Maybe they haven't gone far enough according to Councillor Bell and, and maybe others, but uh, I, I will support the application. I recognize that if we turn it down uh, it will go to the Ontario Land Tribunal, and uh, uh, the, the, the possibility of, of a successful appeal is is, is almost uh, uh, non-existent. So it would be, uh, uh, and I, I say that because it, I think there was an article in the Helen Spectator that said of the 178 uh, applications that were, were referred to the Ontario Land Tribunal this year, only six came back in support of the community so it's a hard it's a hard go and, and it's a costly go and and uh, in terms of reality if we want to talk in terms of reality then, then I think that is a uh, you know, we've done uh, what we can so I support the approval of the application Councillor Laferia and then Councillor Pierce uh, thank you um, I think this is one of those things where everybody who's spoken to this is correct Right. Yet um, we have people from varying uh, different points of view, but they're all correct. Um, when voting on some of these subdivisions in the past, not seeing them in action, um, it's hard to know if the idea is faulty or not in terms of the ratios, et cetera, which is why I actually I commend um, Councillor Bell and Councillor Pierce for bringing this up. Um, and as Councillor Chambers said, bumping it up and having this good discussion, which I think will lend a lot of support to the motion later in the evening about why we need to change the rules and look at the rules and look at the bylaw and adapt it um, as such. But I, I think about it like this. Um, Councillor Wheat once told me that, uh, you know, it's, it's not your road in front of your house, it's the public road. And you could be from New Brunswick or uh, Quebec City or Vancouver. And if you park in front of the house on the front of the road, that's the public road, it's for anybody. Um, I know twice having had condos in this community that I've had to park five blocks away sometimes and walk over. I've had to park at, uh, at um, uh, public parking and, and have walnuts fall in my car and get dents. And that's, but that's something that everybody who buys a condo in this area or anywhere in Ontario needs to understand, right? That parking is um, complicated and you don't own the public laneway in front of your house. That is for the public. So I will be supporting this because I don't believe in not rewarding um, folks who are exceeding the, the, the output. But I do think it is complicated and it's not perfect. And I will also hope that everybody will support Councillor Bell's motion later in the evening about changing the rules. Thank you. Councillor Pierce, you're next. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, just a, a comment if I could. And again, I, I just want to make it perfectly clear that this is not a Lasani problem. This is an overall problem we have with development. And as was alluded to earlier, there is a resolution coming up later on in the evening that we really need to, to get in front of this. Uh, as I say, it, it, it's one of those, it's not specific to any developer, and, it, and it's not 
it's not all types of, of housing units. It's where we get into problems. Single detached, there never seems to be an issue with them. The driveways are, are big enough that you can fit three and four and five cars in them. Where we run into the problems is in these, um, you know, the, the, these townhouse um, subdivisions. That's where we get into the issue. So uh, again, I just want to make it clear, this is not a Lasani problem because, you know, as was stated here a few times, they have gone above and beyond what they are supposed to do as far as parking is concerned. This is a bigger problem than that, and, and we need to get in front of it because it's it's not going to be a good situation if we don't, and I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Councillor Miller, you're next, please. Yeah, just uh, very quickly, um, this is uh, one of those situations where there's no good outcome, and as someone said to me a couple days ago, there's only bad choices out on, on this one. So I will support the the bad choice that costs the county less money, and I'll support the resolution. Um, having said that, I applaud Councillor Bell for his notice of motion, um, trying to ward off future problems of this nature. Um, and, and at the same time, I think it, it, I don't think we should waste this opportunity uh, when you have a problem to to learn from it, to get better at it, and, and maybe from like I say, Councillor Bell's uh, notice of motion, we, we we do have that opportunity, and. Look at tonight earlier, we had the uh, transportation master plan. Um, maybe this helps spur us to more uh, active transportation um, uh, routes and, and, and whatnot in our community and, and maybe more, more public transit. So, um, like you say, it's a bad choice, but I think if we can learn from it and get better, I think we'll all be stronger in the end. Thank you, Councillor Miller. Are there any other comments before we call the vote? All those in favor? Opposed? It's carried. Thank you. 9.2 RPT 317-22 Mather Drain Court of Revision Appointments. Mr. Walton. So what I'm going to be asking for, is there anyone from Council who wants to volunteer to uh, sit on the Court of Revision? I need two people. Councilor Miller? Seconder for Councillor Miller is Councillor Chambers. Okay, that's good. All those in favor? Opposed, thank you. I need one more. Anyone interested? Councillor Chamber, you're interested? Seeking a seconder for Councillor Chamber. It's Councillor Pierce. You wanna to speak to something, Councillor Chamber? Yeah, I, I, I believe, uh, where'd he go? Uh, Mr. Walton. Walton is going to make, there he is. <laughs> Get up there. He's going to make a presentation to explain what a quarter revision is. I'm, I'm familiar with it, and uh, I, I do have a question uh, uh, with regard to uh, the members of a quarter revision. Do they have to be members of council? Okay. okay. Right. Be halfway between our election, we're going to get clarification on what it is. Through, through the mayor to council, um, I'm just going to say a few words about the quarter revision tonight. In the bylaw section of the meeting, it's proposed that the bylaw, the first and second reading be made on the bylaw, um, consider the, um, the bylaw to go forward with uh, the Mather drain. And then the next step for that always is to have the quarter revision. So any person that's assessed on a drain can appeal their assessment and they appeal it to the quarter revision. Now, in this case, the quarter revision is kind of interesting because we have two municipalities involved. So it's prescribed in the, in the drainage act that. The initiating municipality will have two members on the quarter revision, and one of them will be the chair, and each other municipality will have one member. So we have Norwich here, and they, they've been asked to send a member to this quarter revision, tentatively scheduled for, for November 3rd. Now, to be a member of the quarter revision, you do not have to be a member of council. You have to be somebody that could be elected, eligible to be elected to council. So theoretically, there's a lot of people that could be the put on the quarter revision. Some municipalities actually run a quarter revision that has members which are entirely not, not elected uh, officials. And I, I don't think that's only a few municipalities in, in the province. I, I used to be a consulting engineer. I used to write drainage reports. I've been in many council chambers, including this one. I did do a drain that was uh, for the um, for the town of Paris in, in about 1990. This, this council chambers was brand new at the time. I think it was just a year old. So um, I hope that answers your question. Now, the, what the rules for the quarter revision are, though, 
you, you saw earlier tonight, I believe the number at the bottom of this report was 254,000 of assessments that are to be collected by the municipality. So if somebody appeals their assessments to the court, the court can change an assessment of a person. Then they have to put it on to somebody else. That the bottom line has to equal $254,000. Um, there's a process you have to go through there if you're putting on to somebody that isn't notified and all this sort of stuff, but we won't get into that. But at the end of the day, you can't change any of the specifications of the report, and you can't change the total assessment, but you can change who it's, who it's divided to. And your decision can be appealed to the Ontario Drainage Tribunal. Thank you, Mr. Bob. Councillor Chambers. And, and just a question that, that you might want to explain with regard to the assessment on the, of, of the county on, on the roads. Uh, who speaks for the county in, at the Court of Revision? Roads under a drain are actually no different than any other land. So theoretically, the county could appeal theirs. And I've actually been involved with the municipality that appealed not to a Court of Revision, but to, to the, appealed an actual report to the, to the, the Ontario Drainage Tribunal. Um, now that was in a two-tier municipality, so it's a little bit more complicated. Um, perhaps we did appeal the assessment to the Court of Revision as well, but 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 lands and roads are no different. Their 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 ability to do something under the drainage act. Councilor Chambers, and, and just one follow up to that: under the uh, drainage act, if uh, uh, a member of council is acting in the Court of Revision and the county appeals the assessment, is that a conflict of interest? I don't believe so. Back to our back to our um, back to our appointments. We have two people that have offered to do it. We've had seconders for both of them. Are there any others that are interested? Knowing that if I have three, I need to call an election. So we have two with seconders. Any other people interested? Seeing none, I'm going to close the uh, close the nomination. Oh, Councillor Miller. Well, I'll leave this up to your discretion, Mr. Mayor, but I know when we've done these in the past, we would also pick an alternative in case one of the two that were appointed originally couldn't make it for whatever reason. Life happens, so I don't know if we want to go that route. I, we can do it. Okay, well, I think the two that are appointed are both acclaimed, so you're not going anywhere. Well, I'll, no, all I'm saying is, is life happens, and if one of us couldn't make it or my winning ticket comes in tonight for the Lotto Max, I won't be able to make it, so... If we want to point an alternative, I'm just saying, then we should do it tonight. Do it, Councillor Wheat. Yeah, uh, thank you. Through through you, Mr. Mayor, to the clerk. Could you read the recommendation for the two names so that we do this formally prop and properly, even though they're acclaimed? Uh, through through your worship to Council Wheat, um, yes, I will. I do believe the issue would first have to be rectified whether or not Council wanted to appoint an alternate member. Councillor Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, I think if we have two members on there, I think that's sufficient. They don't both necessarily have to be at each meeting as long as there's rep representation there. So I don't think there's. A, I don't think we require a third per se. I think the two is sufficient. Just my opinion. Any other comments about a third appointee? See none. Let's call the vote on the two that have stepped forward. Oh. Okay, I think we've done that, but if you need to hear it again, she's prepared to give it to you again. Okay. So through, through you, Your Worship, to Councillor Wheat, the recommendation that uh, is a staff recommendation would be, whereas the Council of the County of Grant will consider the Mather Drain Report on September 27, 2002, and whereas the Mather Drain affects lands and roads in the County of Grant and the Township of Norwich, that Council appoint Councillor Chambers and Councillor Miller to the Mather Drain Court of Revision tentatively scheduled for November 3rd, 2022. Thank you. We're clear? All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you, guys. You were a safe choice, both of you. Councillor Chambers. I, Mr. Mayor, I, I'd just like to make a comment. Uh, this uh, drainage report is, is one of the, the tamer uh, 
reports that uh, you'll see. I have been in drainage uh, report presentation where there's been 200 people uh, all mad uh, at the same time. So uh, I don't anticipate any uh, appeals, but I, 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 this is this is an unusual drainage report in that it is seems to be uh, fairly simple. Yeah, and it's been brought to my attention that this doesn't happen very often. It's been years and years since we've done this, so it is a big deal. And it's good that you people have been around for more than a couple of minutes so that uh, you'll, you'll be the experienced voice for us. So thank you. Do you have anything else to say, Mr. Bob? Through you, Mr. Mayor to Council. Um, interestingly enough, I think we've got four more um, reports now in the, in, the, in the work, so this is going to become a, a little bit more of a standard practice to have these meetings, and, and mm -hmm. Council will certainly get used to it. Um, I'll just comment just for historical um, context. So back when the previous report I did, which was presented in this council for the town of Paris, it actually involved South Dumfries as well. It was very interesting because uh, it was the first time I met former Mayor Eddie. He came to that meeting and he had he had some interesting things to say about that drain and, and, and it was quite colorful. And it took a little while to get it done, but it, it did get built and it's working very well, I can tell you that. Thank you for that. Gotta love colorful. Any, anything else before we move on? Let's go to 9.3 then, please. It's the um, RPT 25622, Transportation Master Plan Update. Uh, Councilor McAlpine. Moved by myself and seconded by Councilor Howes that the Council approve the Transportation Master Plan Update and direct staff to make the report available or on about November 1st for the public review period and the council directs staff to formalize a decision package for approval as a part of the 2023 budget deliberations and 10 year plan review for the continuation of the gravel to the hard surface program. And that the council directs staff to incorporate the transportation schemes, policy directions and recommendations of the transportation master plan into the new official plan for the county of Brant. And that subject to the comments received from the public and staff be directed to report back to council on the input and complete the final transportation master plan document. Questions? Councillor Howes and Councillor Bell. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have questions to the staff related to this, if, if uh, that's okay. Yep. Um, I have three questions. Um, specific to page 10 of the report or page 440 of our package, um, which discusses the, the long-term bypass strategy as it relates to improving our traffic bottleneck downtown. The report clearly says that a solution is needed and some form of bypass is the recommendation. Um, the first of my questions is, uh, the report references community demand for a new bridge over the Grand. And this is a question that we hear all the time and a topic where there is much misinformation uh, within the community. While the report explains that land availability mechanics, it explains the land avail availability mechanics of why this solution is 20 years away at best. We know that the average citizen is not going to read the report and they're also not going to watch this meeting. Um, our, our community would benefit from a clear explanation of that, and I'm just wondering if this is something we can ask from our communications department. That's my first question. Do you want to hear all three questions, or do you want to do them one at a time? Through you, uh, Mr. Mayor, I think that would be a reasonable thing we could do, would be to craft uh, some sort of communication through the department push it out so that people understand um, what is in the report based on the East Bypass. Uh, thank you. I think that really would be beneficial. And, and I mean, five years ago, somebody explained to me the impact of the gravel pit and the 25-year license to extract gravel and all that. And, and um, But most people aren't aware of that. They don't understand the details, and, uh, which is fair. Um, so I, I think that would, that would help. Um, Second question is, the report goes on to say that our best bypass option for the next 20 years is a west bypass around the north end of Paris toward a link to the 403. Specifically, specifically, the report says that we should encourage trucks and other traffic to use this west bypass instead of Silver Street and presumably instead of going through downtown. 
I worry that most drivers will continue to roll the dice in the hopes of catching a good moment downtown. Can you speak more specifically about the tactics that could be employed to help achieve this encouraging and discouraging strategy? Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. I think it would be, again, like through communication, signage, um, and that type of thing that we could we could employ to try to encourage people to use the bypass. And once I think people start using it, they would, like at least the locals would know it would exist. And then the hope would be that they would continue to use it. And they wouldn't roll the dice as often to, to go through downtown if everything ran smoothly to go around. Okay. Thank you. Maybe we could ask the ECDEV team to encourage a Tim Hortons on Keg Lane. That might uh, help. I, I'd like to add just a little bit more to that. I think the whole wayfinding strategy is, is, the, is the secret to discuss here. So that's a combination of, of the actual signage and working with, you know, the providers that, that do the mapping for Google and, and you know, Waze and all of these other um, 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 apps. That, that people use is, is is the real secret to success for this so that people understand because let's face it a lot of people blindly follow these things regardless of what the signs say so signage is important and, and us working to to make that as efficient as we can is, is the other thing and making that um that um, bypass work better like if you drove it today you'd think that it's terrible but we've got falkland under construction now falkland is the the first big piece of that actually happening and actually, if in the near term, the Bishopsgate interchange actually happens, it really will become a way better than it is. So, you know, we're in discussions with the province about when, when that may happen. I think that that would really be the next piece of that. And in the five years that I've worked here, I've, I've talked about the East Bypass for, for a long time. And I've driven many times from, you know, across Watts Pond and, you know, timed myself as how long it gets down there. And, and, and really, you know, the time is, so we're getting... There is an education piece here, there's the technology piece, and there's the actual signage piece. So I think that that will be, and actually making those intersections better. So we need to do all of it. Thank you for that thorough response. And and, and I agree that the um, impacting the GPS technology, I, I think, will go a long way if, if we can figure out how to do that. I, although I do think that if, if you live in the Brookfield subdivision or if you live on the golf course properties down the road, if you're heading to Swiss Chalet or you're heading to Walmart in Brantford, you're probably still rolling the dice through downtown, and I, that's just hopefully something we can we can change habits on. Um, the report identifies a concern regarding Silver Street and lack of consistent sidewalks. For four years, I've been talking to staff about my desire to prohibit non-local trucks from Silver Street, and I now understand that this is essentially impossible. This is disappointing, but I understand that the explanation. That said, are there any steps that we can take to improve the safety of this area where we know uh, the truck traffic, sorry, we know the report acknowledges a lack of consistent sidewalks and where the sidewalks are directly adjacent to truck traffic between Forest Drive and Sunset? I ask this because last week a child, this is right across the street from my house, I ask because last week a child walking to school tripped fell off the sidewalk, which put her directly in the path of a truck. Her father pulled her back onto the sidewalk, but it was a close call. We've posted signs in this area encouraging kids to walk and bicycle to school, but I fear that we have not done our best to make sure it is safe. Can we look at ways within our transportation master plan and the, the following details and tasks? Can we look at a, a way to improve this situation? Through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, I think we can take a look at uh, like the asphalt lifespan because there'd be things like that we would try to look at to incorporate everything at once, and to look at a larger project that would re renew the asphalt, replace the sidewalk, and make the the you know and create and create the the streetscape that you want that would create the, the safer route for everyone to use on the sidewalk and then and look at where we could fit that into the actual like future um, like the budget and the 10-year plan to get it sooner than later to address that I appreciate that answer and it, it does still sound like a three four five year solution and and I'm with with kids walking to three different schools 
on this same chunk of sidewalk. I, I, I just, I'm wondering if we may look at other creative solutions, and I don't know what those are, but, but I'm, I'm just, if we keep it on the radar, please. Um, and that's the end of my questions. Just my, you know, I'm uh, on the record as seconding that we approve this this master plan, and, and we have waited a long time for this master plan. Um, I am disappointed that there will still be congestion downtown. Is is a is a banner attached to, to the a, a master plan that we're approving? Thank you, Mr. Bradley. You're going to speak, Mr. Walton. Oh, through. Through. okay. Mr. Mayor, through you to council, I want to talk a little bit about the discussion that's happened about congestion tonight. Like, if you go to every downtown of any decent sized urban area, you have congestion. So, at every intersection like that, we can actually identify what the level of congestion is. And you, you, you give the uh, level of service for that intersection, and it goes from A to F. F is sort of on the unacceptable range. Now, you've seen recently a report on this intersection since we did the initial upgrades which have the um, pedestrian uh, the barn stance and the other the first changes we made there and the council approved another change which you just got an email on which is going to happen in the next short period of time i can't remember exactly when but in the next short period of time with the uh, left turn from uh, william street onto grand river street north which will give another improvement to that but that intersection is not at level of service f not even close to it and i, I think that the whole message we have to have on this is that even if we had these bypass, you aren't going to never, ever, ever have level of service A on that intersection. Never. So, you know, I've been through that intersection many times at peak uh, peak hour. You usually get through it in one one cycle. Sometimes two, depending on which this next improvement we're going to make is going to going to improve that. And um, doesn't matter if these bypass comes, there'll still be some congestion there. So we can come back and through a Friday file or something, we'll analyze it and tell you what level of service we're at right now. And then that's another communication piece. And maybe this other communication piece we do, we can, we can actually do that. But I think we need to keep this all in perspective as to where the level of service actually is there. And it can be identified. Thank you very much. And the attention is appreciated. And, and statistics are always good. Um, when the statistics are in their cars backed up to the Kipps funeral home, um, they get frustrated. We hear about it, but but I, I do appreciate your your attention on this, and, and we will look forward to more more information that we can share that has data attached. Thanks, um, Mr. Bradley. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, I just wanted to, to speak to the Silver Street concern, and, and just remind Council that uh, uh, Mr. Crozier and Mr. Demers were here with us. Brand Safe Streets. I'll call it Brand Street. Brand Safe Streets 1.0. Uh, report and the council directed them to go away and, and, and craft up what I would call Brand Safe Streets 2.0. And actually, I was just speaking with Mr. Demers the other day. Uh, Councilor Bell had, had passed on some some concerns on King Edward Street, and I haven't responded yet, by the way. But um, actually, uh, it was one of the solutions will be uh, part of the longer term strategy for Brand Safe Streets on, uh, on on those concerns, which I'll respond to later this week. <laughs> um, but but so I think you know we can uh, we can certainly look at Silver Street as part of that Brand Safe Streets 2.0, uh, and and see if there isn't some interim things we can do until the longer term um, improvements that would that would you know bring in built permanently built uh, safety aspects. So so I think that that's all a good part. I think council expressed an interest in investing more in the Brand Safe Streets pro pro program and the. Uh, Kind of the mid 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 range or longer term uh, traffic safety solutions that we could incorporate through that program, again with some with some increased spending. So you'll see that. Um, I don't know. Obviously, it'll be the new council that sees that. But but that that is probably a good solution on the interim for a place like Silver Street. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Councillor Bell. You're next. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through to through to uh, through you to Rob and, and Mark. I just, just want to reiterate the point I made to the IVI folks that the issue of a bridge um, to provide an eastern bypass to me is just one solution to a bigger problem. And, and I would like that the uh, final draft of the transportation master plan actually talks about what the problem is that you're trying to solve and not whether we can put a bridge there or not. Uh, I think it's really important to recognize the time frame as well because Paris will be built, Northern Paris will be probably built out by 2031. So to put in a report that somewhere between 2031 and 2041 will actually get round to 
doing an assessment, I think is inappropriate. I think we know what's coming. We know what can be built there. We can forecast already the level of traffic uh, that will be generated in the north of Paris. So I, I would really encourage that we bring that forward. Which brings me to the, the, the more the broader point about how you determine when things happen. What are the how do you determine what the priorities are? I was really um, taken aback by the well-argued and logical approach on gravel to hard top. I thought that was really well done. I could understand it. I could, I could support that. I could argue that to other people. Um, I would like to see that we have the similar kind of, of rationale and logic that underpins the timing and the sequencing of all the activities in, in the plan. Uh, it may take a bit of time. I appreciate that. But going back to Councillor Howe's point, I, I'm not feeling like I can approve the master plan. I, I'm not quite sure that approving an update means I'm approving the plan, because I'm not. Uh, I think there are too many open questions there. And, and questions around timeline, sequencing, priorities, I think are really important and should form part of the plan. I'll stop at that. I've got more questions, but maybe the, the Rob and Mark would like to respond. Through you, Mr. Mayor, can I ask, uh, Councillor Bell, have you read the phase reports or only the summary report? I, I've read them all. But okay. It, yeah, I have read them all. But we need we need to think about how we communicate all of this. Uh, it's not just about what, what I've read, because I can guarantee that our community will not read everything. But they need to have it fed to them, and they need to be on. They need to be able to understand the logic that we're following. And I would have such great difficulty telling people in Ward 2, because it's a Ward 2 issue, in a sense, that you know we have to wait till 2037 before we actually look to see whether we can solve a problem that, that we can recognize today and will only recognize as getting more complicated, more exacerbated as we develop out the north of Paris. So, you know, it, it's, it's a constructive criticism. I, I'm, not, I'm not being difficult here. But I think we do need to be able to sell this because people have a genuinely passionate interest in traffic, in getting across town, in being able to move around. I, I still have questions, if I may, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead, Councillor Bell. I so think Rob wants to answer. Oh, you can answer first. Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Councillor Bell. So you heard part of the answer to this already from, from IBI in the presentation before. This was, they did do a traffic model of, of the entire county and, 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 and mapped out what the issues were and, and then put the priority and then, then prioritized how they work. You know, we, we've talked about that the, the strategy for traffic pairs for the next 10 years is the Western Bypass and the other improvements which are shown in the 10-year period. And that models it to show that you'd have acceptable levels of service. Now, how we sell that to the public, I guess, is, is another question, but, but that question is answered in, in the TMP. If I may, Mr. Mayor, the, the question may be answered somewhere deep in volume three, but you're going out on a 30-day communication and, and feedback loop with, with the community. They will not understand that they have to go to page 47 of volume three. You need to be able to say very clearly, you need to be able to explain what the Western Bypass will do. And, and, the, and that's why I asked the question about modeling. And we may be, need to be able to put that in a an appropriately simple way that can be understood by the typical rider or driver in town uh, and not us as engineers or council members who have access and perhaps the time to, to read something more. Uh, perhaps you could respond to that. Well, I'd have to tell you that um, there's um, engineers out there that don't understand some of this stuff. You know, this is very complicated stuff, the models and, you know, the, the input you put into it to like is, is very complicated stuff. I think the, I already actually answered this question when I answered one of um, Councillor Howe's questions when us getting the information out there and the level of service will be provided by what's what's happening here. I think that that's really the, the simple answer to these questions and, and we will work on getting some communications in that regard together. No, I thank you for that. If I, just a couple more questions if I may. Um, there are a number of recommendations for study um, for example, downtown Paris. And I honestly expected that we would have studied them and that the transportation master plan would have come forward with recommendations. So I, I'll express my disappointment that the 
result of the transportation master plan is to recommend a study. I think that, that is a, a bit of a fail for me. I also want to bring forward one particular issue, and that's the wonky junction. Now, you know, Rob, what the wonky junction is. It's the junction of King Edward, Dundas, Laurel, and Hanlon Place. And it is one of the principal exits and entrances to the Nith Peninsula development, which will become a real focus in the coming years. And my understanding, again, was that this transportation master plan would come forward with an answer to that, a recommendation, and a timeline. Uh, I, I already am getting complaints, and Greg Bergeron must be pulling his hair out because of it, about people driving down Dundas Street in big trucks. It will only get worse when we have 500 homes with 1,000 or 1,500 cars that go down Dundas Street one way or the other. Uh, and if they go towards town, they're going to hit that junction. And it is already incredibly difficult to come out of Laurel Street onto uh, King Edward Street now. And people do take some awful risks on that junction. I, and I really would like to, and it comes back to priorities, I'd like to see that move forward uh, with some urgency because we're actually starting to work now on the Nith Peninsula development. It won't be long before we start to see a much greater uptick in, in traffic. Through the mayor to Councillor um, Bell. So, the two studies you, you speak of, downtown Paris and this one, um, this is the whole difference between the airplane level and, and the local level. So, the, these th things will come back to council for consideration and for, but you need to concentrate on the issues there. This is not a TMP issue, this is a localized traffic issue. Um, and, and quite frankly, we already have a traffic uh, solution for that area. Now, some people in that area maybe don't like what, what's proposed, but in the, in the, in the approval of the, the Nith Peninsula subdivision, there is, there is a proposed solution there. Um, the timing of what we do and whatever, I think we do have to look at some, uh, some, some possible revisions to that and, and then to get some buy-in to what, what actually is happening there. Uh, there is definitely a big project to do. But to pull that into the TMP actually would be a disservice to that project because it wouldn't get the attention it needs. So um, so the decision was made, and, and IBI has already worked on this, and we're, we're working on a solution. So in the in the next year, that will be coming in front of council. Okay, one very final question, Mr. Mayor. Um, what's the provincial timeline for the Bishopsgate Road and 403 junction? Because the, the western bypass really depends on that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, so, uh, currently, the, the province has said you can build it whenever you want as long as you fund it. Um, at this point, we have no funding commitment from the province. We've sat in front of the minister. Mayor Bailey and I have sat in front of the minister, as well as many of you. And Mayor Eddie and I previously <laughs> sat in front of the minister many times uh, since 2016, since the, since the uh, EA for that project wrapped up or was in the process of wrapping up. So that's, that's eight years of... of presentations to the ministries, countless uh, discussions with uh, senior and, and level staff at the, at, the, at the MTO. And at this point, they, they still don't look at it as, as a priority that they're prepared to fund. Now, we have had some positive discussions with them that they're you know, a little more um, interested in the project, but at this point, we have no funding. So, so we're on our own. It's, it's a very expensive project, significantly less expensive than the uh, <laughs> East Paris uh, bypass bridge that, that's been talked about a bit tonight. So, you know, it just goes to show the context of these challenges that we're facing uh, in terms of these projects, that this is this is a big project and, and we have, it, it is, it's a provincial highway owned by the province. Uh, the interchange itself is owned by the province and the province at this point has no interest in contributing to it. So, so I guess that shows you the, the, the challenges we as a small municipality face to, to deal with, uh, with, with our, with Traffic challenges. So. Okay. Well, Through you, Mr. Mayor, to Council. And just to add on to that, after the most recent um, OGRA meeting with um, uh, Minister Mulrooney, there actually has been a staff meeting to talk about where this project might go. Now, there's no commitment out of that, but at least there was a follow up to the meeting and, and some discussion on where, where this project might, might go and what the timing of our other um, projects in the area are. Because this all does relate to the, you know, the ramp terminal improvements we're going to do on 403, what we might do on power line in the interim, 
And uh, so those discussions have started, and I think that that's at least a very positive sign because as recently as about three years ago, we had a, a minister's letter which said, um, you're on your own, like, we're not helping you at all. So that is an improvement. And But there's no, we can't say what the timing would be. Not a great answer, Councillor Bell, but it's an answer. Councillor Weech, you're next, please. Uh, uh, thank you. Through you, um, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Um, first, a comment to a couple of my fellow councillors that indicated that not everybody reads the report thoroughly well. Very minor thing in here is pathways and walking trails and bicycle trails. But I've had some members that read the report and are not so concerned about gravel through hardtop or interchanges wherever. They're concerned about walking trails that are adjacent to their farm properties and the garbage that will be thrown on their property from the cycling and walking trip. So like I said to the representative from IBI earlier in the evening, I try and take into consideration when you're doing a report like this to converse with the property owners that are going to abut that trail, whether it be walking or cycling, and try and indicate to them that we will try and discourage the users of said trail from distributing their garbage onto the adjacent properties that are along that trail. So there is some people, uh, fellow counselors, that do read the final print because that was in the fine print where my most concern was gravel hardtop. And it has been, as Councillor Coleman knows, my biggest concern for years has been conversion from gravel to hard surface. And at the conclusion of this meeting, uh, to my fellow councillors from Paris, I'd like to talk about traffic being stopped at the Kip Street and then crossing the King William Street Bridge because <coughs> I did it for a whole year with my granddaughter picking her up from high school at 3.15 in the afternoon. Thank you, Councillor Weed. Are there any other questions? Councillor Pierce, you're next, and then um, Councillor Ferrier. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Through you, um, first of all, I want to say, you know, thank you for this report. Um, it's been a long time we've spoken of this transportation master plan. Um, we finally have something in front of us. Um, if we're being totally honest, I, I, I thought there would be a little more meat to it. There's, there's, there's stuff in there, don't get me wrong, uh, but I thought there would be more expansion of, of, of a different, of, of a few of these points in here. Um, as I said earlier, in regards to the, the Lasani development there, that, you know, they met regulations, not reality. Um, I think some of the things in this transportation plan are, 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 are good. They've hit it bang on, but there's other things in this, in this plan, as far as just my opinion, um, met the requirements of the TMP, but uh, don't meet the requirements of reality because the, the issue of, of you know, we're looking, you know, five to ten years down the road for some of these things. To Councillor Bell's point, we have a problem now. And and I understand the fact, and as I've explained to people when I'm going around the doors and I've said it for years, once you get into the downtown core, um, you're absolutely right. That, that intersection at William Street and Grand River, other than, you know, getting smart lights in there and stuff like that, there, there's really not much more we can do with that. And I appreciate the fact of this, you know, the Western Bypass, because as far as I'm concerned, any sort of bypass to the east is so far in the distance that, honestly, it, it can come off the it can come off the table. Because by the time we get to that point in time, if we don't have something, then it's going to be it's going to be mayhem. With the Western Bypass and the discussion that we've had in regards to the interchange of Bishop's Gate Road, if in fact the the province comes to the table with some funding on it, fantastic. If they don't come to the table with funding, that's going to come out of our taxpayers' dollars, and that's going to be a that's going to be a huge decision to make because that's that's not a that's not a small task. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of time in order to do that, which would suggest that, as is in one of the pictures here, the Western Bypass will then go, you know, Putttown Road through Falkland and then across Powerline Road back into to Restacres Road. Um, I am not 100% sure that that's going to alleviate a lot of the, a lot of the issues. It may even compound some of the issues. 
Um, it was spoken to earlier in regards to sufficient signage, education, technology, technology timelines. I think it's critical that as much information, and you both alluded to the fact that you know we can do that, as much information as we can get out communicated to the public of you know expanding on some of these points, getting in not into the, the, the deep and dirties, but in, in expanding a little bit more into consumable bits that the public is going to be able to suggest that, hey, you know what, this is going to maybe get us to a, a spot where it's going to ease things up. I think that, it, you know, you said that we could do that, that would be perfect. Um, again, I, I appreciate the efforts that have gone into this. It's, it's not an easy thing to do, especially considering, you know, if, if we look back five years and then the next five years, the amount of growth that's, that has come and is coming to the, to the county, um, the vast, vast majority of it in the Paris area, and it's going to be coming to the St. George area, I, I, I really think that we need to shorten our timelines on, on a lot of these things in here because the, the problem is now. The problem isn't 10 years down the road. You don't have to comment on that. That's just my opinion on this report. But again, thank you for the report. Um, it is something tangible we can take forward. We just need to make sure that the public can digest it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. <clears throat> Councillor LaFerrier, do they want to? Oh, no? Okay. Um, I apologize in advance, Mr. Mayor. Um, my notes are a mess because I wanted to hear the back and forth, the dialogue. Um, so I'm sorry if I go a little confusing here. I'll try to keep it simple. Uh, through you to, to both Rob and Mark, um, again, thank you for the report. And also, I want to highlight this again. The pieces there on cycling, on the pedestrian walkways, on public transportation, all also part of something. We've been saying for a long time, this can't just be about traffic. Uh, and with that in mind, um, it was said earlier in the meeting that the city and county joint transportation review committee has sort of started back up and will continue to, to move forward. And I'm so happy to hear that because I think it's very important. And I think it's very obvious there are lots of reasons why in the middle of this term that couldn't happen, um, COVID being just one of them. Um, I, I have two questions about that and then I have other questions about the TMP. One is will this city and county joint transportation review committee include discussion about one of the TMP bullets about public transportation partnership? And if so, can staff responsible for public transportation from both the city and the county also be included in those meetings? Is that appropriate? Through you, Mr. Mayor, to uh, Councilor LaFerrier, and I hope Allison is uh, listening, actually. The joint transportation plan that we're talking about here really is a road is a roads plan, it isn't as, so that doesn't mean that that discussion can't happen in other ways, so, um, but that's the reality, this is a, it's a really a roads, uh, it's a road study. The, the, the Joint Transportation Review Committee? Yes. Okay. Um, so on that then, thank you for clarifying that, maybe that can happen in another way. Um, it, is the function of something like this, is part of it, could part of it be that the city and the county agreeing to jointly advocate for two to three priorities for each other? Uh, and what I mean by that is, I think the city and the county both have so many things where really the buck stops at the province, but the province needs a larger group, and even possibly Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, to say, you know, a Bishopsgate bypass would actually help us as well. You know, a Green Lane Bridge would actually help us as well and our, our citizens. Is that something where, again, I don't know what the priorities necessarily would be, but where two or three priorities each could be, we're going to work together to advocate at a larger body to the province? Through the Mayor of Council of the Fair Area, that's, a, that's an excellent point. Now, some people on Council will be around long enough to uh, realize that at one time the, the province was going to do a Highway 24 corridor study. Mm -hmm. And I worked in an adjacent municipality at the time, and there was a promise made that actually trust the, the, the boundary of that would come out to trust the road. So this whole issue of the regional transportation in this area would be addressed. And quite frankly, the idea of a, an eastern bypass isn't a local Paris issue. It's a regional transportation issue, and it relates to the, um, the Oak Park one in in, uh, in Brantford as well. Like this, all connects together and needs to be looked at together. You can't look at it in isolation. And when the study is done for this, there's going to be other people come out of the woodwork that don't find this to be an acceptable way to do it, just as has happened with Oak Park. So there's going to be a very complicated study. Really needs to be taken on by the province because the region of Waterloo needs say in this. Everybody needs say in this. This this is going to become a, a regional corridor. For that project to be a local project is unaffordable. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a simple simple math on that. So um, so I, I hope that what you're um, suggesting here is true. There can be, and I don't see any reason it can't be an outcome of this. 
and um, I add those other comments on, which are just my own. No, wonderful. And uh, another thing here, when, when I look, you know, you talked about several years back, 20 years ago, um, you know, I heard from residents about backups in downtown Paris 25 years ago, right, especially at certain times. I know about them myself from moving here over 10 years ago and that being an issue then. Um, five years ago, when we moved from one side, of, well, really Ward 3 to a side in Ward 2, uh, a big part of the discussion, being somebody that works full-time in Hamilton and my wife is working in Brantford, was which side of the light should we live on for our own peace of mind and, and safety. If we lived in Kitchener, I'd want to live in the north end of Ward 2. If I, sorry, if I work in Kitchener. If I work in Hamilton, I definitely want to be on the other side of the lights. Um, so, so this is a, a big thing, and I actually want to say that despite the complaints we get, when you look at the growth, as Councillor Pierce said, over the last five years and over the last 10 years, the problem could be substantially worse had we not made a lot of the decisions we have made. Um, people want it to be better, but again, I, I think utilizing what you were talking about before about the, the sort of ADAF grading system will at least give people data and a baseline and also the realities of which what moves the province and what doesn't. You know, I've said for years now that, you know, the, the province and, and the development tribunal doesn't see uh, 12 minutes on certain times a day from getting to point A to point B as a traffic problem, even though you might see it in your car that day. And if you live in Toronto and you go 12 minutes and go a block and a half, you know, you, you, you see the, the sort of scale that you're working with. So my question looking at all that is, four years ago, and, and I say this to the public, be weary of people who promise easy solutions to complex issues. Um, four years ago, I, I didn't say, hey, let's, we're going to have a Green Lane Bridge by the end of the term. I said, we need a feasibility report on a Green Lane Bridge. Is it possible that the wording within the TMP and the final draft could address that? Because to, when I look at it, between you and the presenter today saying $100 million is, eh, sounds about right, right now for a bridge, that we have to wait for the gravel pit to finish with their rights to that part of the land, that we'll have an environmental study, indigenous interests, which we haven't really talked about, archeological studies, that Bishopsgate is further along, less complex, less, complex, uh, less costly, uh, and still can't get provincial help on that. I don't know if it's even allowed to be in the DCs yet. That, to be frank, I think the TMP should say that, that, or at least say that the uh, a, a, an east side, uh, by, an east bypass through Paris is not feasible as a single tier municipality, at the very least. If not, it's just not feasible for at least the next 20 years, just so that we're all on the same page and we don't have folks, you know, up hoping and dreaming that two years from now we'll magically have a bridge. Uh, is that possible? So, through the through the Mayor to Council. So this is a draft document. We're taking input. We're taking input from councillors, and, uh, and you know, I, I think that the, that is some, uh, um, you know, the reality of that situation is something we have to address. Okay. And um, I, I think that Scott Johnson did a good job talking before about you know balancing all the priorities and coming up with a solution for the county. This wasn't about this TMP wasn't about one project. It's about a whole list of projects that. Um, and you, you know, you talk about the massive amount of dollars that all of them add up to. It's hard to contemplate how we'd ever do them all. But you know, you put together a plan and you, you work on ways to do them. And uh, you know, I think that a lot of discussion tonight does point out how important really that Bishopsgate interchange is to us. And, and you know, we, we need to take some renewed vigor to the province to say, okay, we've had the first meeting on this. Like, let's get this thing going. Um, we do have it in our DCs for our what we figure our part of it would be. So. Uh, if the province would step up with some reasonable amount of funding, I, I would say that in the next five years we could do that project. I appreciate that. So please consider that con context for the final report or input. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Wheaton, then Councillor Chambers, please. Uh, just listening to <coughs> comments <coughs> through you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, not so much a, a question, but just listening to comments around the table. We talked about other communities getting involved. I can recall a few years ago when the province was looking at a new 20, Highway 24, which was going to connect Waterloo, Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge, Guelph, from the 401 to the 403. I, how that would help Paris and Brant County, I really don't know. But that conversation has died, has died recently. But it was pretty heavy a few years ago. And when I say a few years ago, I'm talking less than seven or eight since I was on council, that there was a lot of discussion there. But then the province went ahead and did some minor improvements to the existing Highway 24, which in my opinion really didn't help traffic because both the city 
of Cambridge and the city of Brantford are like bookends to that road. It's really not a bypass of anything. It's just improvements, left turn lanes, and a little bit wider shoulder, and improving the shoulder. But there was heavy discussion a few years ago about connecting the southern part of Waterloo County, which was Cambridge, Kitchener, Waterloo, Guelph, with the new Highway 24 down to 403 from the 401. How that would affect us, I really don't know. That's for further discussion for people like yourself. Thank you, Councilor Reed. Councilor Chambers. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and through to the uh, uh, staff. Uh, j just with regard to the Bishopgate Road, Bishopsgate interchange, we've talked. <clears throat> we've talked specifically and almost exclusively about the northern uh, uh, advantages. Well, if you look at the southern part of Bishopsgate Road, uh, there are tremendous disadvantages to the interchange at Bishopsgate, uh, at the Bishopsgate interchange. And that's with regard to, first of all, the intersection at 53 and Bishopsgate, which we had a discussion last week about the deficiencies associated with that interchange. Uh, and then the village of Scotland, we've, we've had discussions about the effect of trucks and traffic on the rural villages that uh, whose streets aren't the uh, rural roads uh, going around uh, Paris, so you're going to go be, and, and the reason I suggested we, we need to look at Norfolk County is Bishopsgate Road uh, is a shortcut to the 403 rather than going on Highway 24, and trucks go that way now, as you know, and that's why there's so many trucks on Bishopsgate Road, the southern end. And there's also gravel on the southern end of uh, Bishopsgate Road as well. So don't forget about the southern part of Bishopsgate Road. Uh, and get lost in, in the uh, Paris bypass because uh, sometimes solving one problem, you don't want to have it just transferred to another part of the uh, uh, situation. So keep in mind there's a southern part of the Bishopsgate Road as well. Thank you, Councilor Chambers. Councilor Miller, please. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Mayor. Uh, just just a couple comments. Um, I, I, I know about the traffic in Paris because I, I have to Sometimes you have an appointment early morning. It's, it's bad. But I, I think it's fair to say it's it's bad in a lot of towns that are similar in size to Paris. Um, go to Ingersoll. Go to St. Thomas. Go to Tilsonburg. Drive around there at peak times. It's You're waiting at some of those lights for a while. So it's not just Paris. Um, I, I just want to I wanna thank staff, too, for, for this report. There's a lot of good information. I, I don't keep every report, but this one's a keeper. If I put it in this desk, I don't lose it eventually. But um, I was surprised that uh, we only did 74 kilometers um, were converted from gravel to hardtop from 2010 to 2022. I was quite surprised. So that leaves 183 kilometers to go, of which about 92 kilometers looks like good candidates. They put some numbers to that. They said at around 100 average daily traffic counts, the life cycle is probably cheaper to go hard surface versus gravel. Those are good numbers. I can use those when people call me. Um, <laughs> having said that, you, you listed a whole bunch of roads, phase one, phase two. So I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll support what I can support. Um, <laughs> hope people around the table support it too. And interestingly enough, I look quite anxiously at this list. And there's four regulars that call me about getting their road done. And none of their roads was on any of those lists. So... Let's just keep plugging away as best we can. So those are my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Mayor. Councillor Coleman, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and, and I appreciate the report and, and uh, well done as, as best as possible. It is, a, as you say, the airplane level and whatnot, and we have local level issues. And I do support gravel to hard surface. There's no doubt about that. And, and the more we can get done in, in the timeline, and I know Councilor Chambers mentioned it, like Alderman County, they're, they're pushing to get all roads gravel to hard surface. It would be great. But I look at page nine or whatever, this is 439 of the report. And that three lines in there, the total investment. 38.5 to 72.4 million between 2021 and 2031. That comes from the taxpayers of the County of Brantford. 
Somebody's got to pay for it. So then there's two more lines. I don't even want to get to them. So you get my point. I support it, but it, it comes at a cost. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Coleman. Are there any other comments? Oh, Councillor Gatward. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, through you to staff, um, first of all, I want to say thank you for putting that 53 and Pleasant Ridge Road and Forest Road intersection in the short term capital plan. 2024 um, 2025 is probably good for those homes that are being built. And I don't want to see a child get hurt trying to cross four lanes of traffic out there without any assistance from some sort of a signal or whatever. So that's great news. And I will let the residents know out there that have been constantly sending letters and calling and emails that that's the, the new plan. Um, and I appreciate that they may look at that intersection at Phelps that Councillor Coleman mentioned earlier, um, Phelps and Cockshut and County Road 18, and, and perhaps um, widening it. The other thing I wanted to mention in the gravel to hardtop list, um, it's a boundary road and it's on page 456, um, sorry, 466, and it's called Bateman Line. And I've mentioned this before, but I will mention it again. I don't think that we should hard chop Bateman Line. Bateman Line is where many stolen vehicles end up and they're set on fire. If you look at the fire chief's history, I was there once at the administration building. There was a map on the wall and Bateman Line was littered with pins for car fires and car fires destroy hard surface roads. So it would be my recommendation not to waste dollars hard topping Bateman line for that reason. And and there's other roads too that it happens, but not the same as Bateman road or Bateman line. So I just hope staff will take note of that because um, I don't think we should waste money hard topping it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gatward. <clears throat> Are there any other questions? Comments. So this was a echo. Sure. Thank you. And I, just if you could indulge me for a second, I just I heard. First of all, I think it's been a very good uh, conversation. I think this was one of our uh, one of the final lingering projects that we wanted to get through with our uh, with our strategic plan, and I'm pleased to see it uh, in front of the council and in the, in the schedule of that plan. Um, you know, I, I did, did hear a lot of I think you know, discussion about you know projects, the, the high level nature of this, this is a master plan, it, it's, it's approached on a high level. You know, it's not a capital plan, it's a guideline to capital planning and I think that's important for us to remember um, because if we were to come up with a capital plan for our road system as large as our road system, the plan would never get done. Like we, 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 we wouldn't be sitting here tonight, we'd be talking about trying to get this thing done for the next five years. And I maybe, I heard a lot of discussion about timeline too, and you know, that's, that's a long way off, 2031, that's never gonna happen. And um, you know, I just, it's, it's worth noting, I was thinking about it as, as I was listening to the discussion, so that the transportation master plan that preceded the 2016 update, you know, some of its three core key projects was uh, Rest Acres Road, Grand River Street North, and the Bishopsgate Road Interchange. And, you know, I think at the time we, we said, okay, well, we'll get buckled down and we'll get going on those EAs and then those projects would happen. Those EAs took a long time. And when they were happening, people were saying, you guys are moving way too fast on this. This is very significant. You're changing our lives here. You're taking, you're taking land. You're changing the nature of how traffic moves through the municipality. So I think we have to remember that. The 2031 is not that far away. And uh, we've got a lot of work to do. We're still trying to, to, to wrap those projects up from that 
the earlier transportation master plan back in 2010, I think it was. Um, and it just shows you, and I think we've all been involved with these projects, and many of you were you know, very involved in those EAs. They took a long time, and they were complex, controversial. They, uh, they, they, you know, they had to, to go in different directions as they, as they matured, and, and, and these, these things need to take time. And these are big decisions, big changes for a municipality, and, and I think the timelines that are laid out in the, in the plan are, are realistic based on the experience I saw with, with that earlier plan. So, so I think that's a, just a comment I wanted to make uh, before Council considers the, the, the plan that's been put forward. Thank you, Mr. Chair, or Your Worship. Thank you, Michael. Is there any other comments or concerns? <clears throat> I'd just like to remind you again, too, as we're voting on this, that it is just an update and it is fluid. It's going to keep changing. It may have been a disappointment for some of us, for some of you, um, but it is, uh, the discussion was great tonight. And uh, I think I, I can support it knowing that it's uh, not finished yet. It's only a, it's only a uh, plan. With that being said, no other questions, comments? Call the vote. All those in favor? Thanks, Councillor Gatward. Carry. <laughs> <laughs> Nine point four, please. It's um, two thousand and twenty one surplus. Heather Mifflin. Oh, Councillor Wheat, sorry. Councillor Wheat. It's moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Ferrier that the twenty twenty one surplus report be received as information. And that is included in the twenty twenty two budget, four hundred thousand dollars of the twenty twenty one surplus be carried forward to 2022. At the remaining 2021 surplus of $863,000 plus dollars be transferred to the contingency reserve for unanticipated expenditures. Thank you. Are there any questions or concerns? Councillor Chambers, you're first. J just I'm wondering if, if the treasurer can, can explain the rationale for putting uh, $863,000 into a contingency reserve which we don't know what it's for, and it seems like a lot of money. Uh, if something comes up, it's just, if you have the money there, it's easy to do. Uh, as and I'm wondering if you might explain uh, uh, why perhaps it's not going to pay down debt. Heather, uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, uh, there is a, included also in the 2022 budget was 350,000 that we brought in from the contingency reserve to as a rate stabilization. So there's that piece. We, there is the possibility of uh, lowering debt that isn't issued. We can't, once debt is, is issued through IO, it is pretty much locked in. We have to carry it through. So we could, I suppose, but there are, 2022 um, has, you know, we did have COVID pressures at the beginning of the year, as well as inflationary pressures. So I'm not sure the picture for 2022 or what we're going to look at in the 2023 budget. So just, just to follow up then, as we craft the, the next budget, some of this, perhaps some of this $860,000 can be used to offset the levy like we did last year coming from the contingency reserve. Correct. And that's a decision that council will have to make. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed and car carried. Thank you. 9.5. Uh, we're going to talk about the loan for the Cowan Community Health Hub. Mr. Bradley. Oh, Councillor Bell, you have that. Get it on the floor, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, do you want me to read the whole thing? Uh, yes, yeah, if okay. you could. Uh, so moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Pierce. Whereas the Cowan Community Health Hub is now completed and operating, and whereas previous reports to Council identified that this project would be transferred to Brant Municipal Enterprises, Inc., the County of Brant's wholly owned Municipal Services Corporation at an appropriate time, and whereas the County of Brant approved the transfer of the Cowan Community Health Hub to the ownership of Brant Municipal Enterprises, Inc. in June 2022, 
with the intent that the county of Brant would receive an 8.2 million special shareholder dividend from Brant Municipal Enterprises to discharge the amount owing on the project, which BME would fund from sources which include long-term debt through a debenture from Infrastructure Ontario. And whereas BME has been recently advised that in order to obtain financing for the project from Infrastructure Ontario, a municipal guarantee on the debenture is required. Therefore, that the County of Brant provide a municipal guarantee on the debenture from Infrastructure Ontario to finance BME's acquisition of the Cowan Community Health Hub. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Is everyone clear? Any questions for Councillor Bell or to Michael? Seeing none, call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Everyone has it in front of them. Motion to receive it. Actually, can I make a motion to second it? Sure. So we could support it. Sure. Seeking a seconder. Councillor House. Now we'll talk about it now that it's on the floor. Is there any comments? Councillor Miller? Well, if, if you read it, <laughs> um, they're actually looking for commentary um, on the resolution itself. And I, um, I don't know if this is something, Mr. Mayor, will you refer to staff for some comments on this or we craft our own? I, I'll leave that. But I'm just saying that that, that, is, that is the request. They're looking for commentary from those that could get a copy of this resolution. Councillor Ferry, you want to speak to that? Yeah, my, my motion was to support, uh, we support the motion, right? Like that is, that we support what they, like all the whereas clauses and essentially that we're supporting the resolution and that we stand in support of such a resolution. Everyone's clear? Call the vote. All those in favor? Opposed? Carry. Resolutions. Councillor Bell, this is yours. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. So this is uh, following on from the notice of motion last week, and, and the eagle-eyed amongst you will recognize this is a slightly different um, presentation of the motion. This has been, my, my draft was recrafted by the planning department and it's been put in planning ease um, so it actually uh, it stands the test of, of, of the planning department but the essence is still the same that we recognize that we have a growing problem of parking particularly in the, the higher density areas in, in new subdivisions and I believe that we need to uh, advance the planned review of our zoning bylaw and with it the parking bylaw in the absence of having a completed official plan, uh, recognizing that we should get ahead of this issue if we possibly can. I, I do recall from last week that uh, Councillor Chambers was interested to hear from the planning staff and I would call upon planning staff if I may to uh, give their perspective. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Who's here? Pa Pam's here? Through, uh, through Mayor Bailey to uh, Council, thank you for an opportunity to quickly connect with you on parking. I've been making some notes uh, while you've been speaking or while I've been hearing you, and uh, Matt and Jen are both online as well tonight. So I think first and foremost, uh, we have to remember that parking is not just a zoning bylaw challenge. There are many things that create parking challenges in the county of Brant. And uh, we are a growing community. Uh, we're in the Greater Golden Horseshoe in the growth plan. Uh, we have density requirements, but we are still a rural municipality without public transit. Our communities are changing. They're diverse and gener general, um, generational family homes are becoming a thing. And uh, we have more people living in one home, and therefore we have more vehicles. So we're also experiencing more um, accessory residential units and different uh, uses in homes, some which are legal and some which are not legal, uh, which also require parking. So enforcement will be key, education and outreach will be key, but in terms of um, what we can do in development services, 
we can absolutely look at to our new zoning bylaw. Uh, we're hopefully going to be there by now with the OP and then the comprehensive zoning bylaw. But we can look at, at um, doing a provision to our, our zoning bylaw to look at things like uh, not having a parking requirement in garages, looking at our site setbacks, looking at shared driving spaces, those sorts of things. Um, that will take a little bit of time. Uh, it's not a, an overnight process, um, but we would like to bring something back probably in December to council and ask for some direction in terms of what you would like to see. And then we're figuring probably by about spring we can bring those zoning provisions to you with some public uh, input before that. So we, we have charted out a plan. <laughs> we have heard you. Uh, there are things we can do in the short term, in the long term, in the medium term. Um, and we'd like to work with our colleagues in other areas of the department to bring back something again to you in December and then hopefully the zoning provisions in the spring. Councillor Bell? Yeah, thank you very much, Pam. I, I, when we talked earlier today, I did ask a question. I said I would ask it again today uh, in the meeting. Um, clearly, the discussion earlier around the Lozani subdivision was sort of centered on the fact that they did exactly as we asked them to do and, and we were really making a plea to them as good neighbors, good partners in our community to work with us to provide a solution which is wider than that one particular subdivision. Uh, and I asked the question of you today, well, where, where do we stand with some of the other major subdivisions that are currently either in just started or about to come along. For example, the Nith Peninsula, the second part of the Liv Scenic Ridge development. Are we able to impact them or are we going to just compound the problem we talked about earlier today? Yeah, through uh, the mayor to Councillor Bell, that's an excellent question. Um, with many of our developments, they're already in the pipeline. They've already gone through pre consultation, they've already gone through. Um, circulation and reviews with staff. We're now under Bill 109 timelines, which can make things even more challenging. Uh, so for many of those developments, we do have to follow the existing provisions in the bylaw. Uh, for new developments that are coming forward, and I'm talking about brand new developments, those are the ones that we can have some good, honest conversations with our developers and ask for additional parking. Um, we found a tool today, maybe to ask for some commuter parking. Uh, that is a, an a opportunity for us to create some parking and visitor parking lots in some of our newer subdivisions. So there are things that we can do external to the bylaw, but again, we do have to remember that the zoning bylaw is in place, and just as we heard earlier this evening, uh, there are developers that will continue to use uh, the, the, the provisions of the bylaw. Are there any other questions, Councillor Chambers? Uh, if, if I might, uh, through you to the uh, uh, yeah. Pam, yeah. and, and I, I understand completely what uh, the issues are, and, and with John and, and John uh, walking through the, the neighborhoods, they, they see it firsthand. I, I, I don't. I, I'm um, the original resolution had a, a, an urgency aspect to it, and this is a little bit uh, uh, more conducive to. Uh, staff having the time to do that. I, I just wanted to uh, uh, talk about staff time for a minute. And I alluded to an article that I read in, in the Hamilton Spectator. I, I forwarded that to, to Pam that, that said that uh, so far this year, there's been 178 um, referrals to the Ontario Lad Tribunal and only six of them uh, came back in support of the communities. But the interesting thing was that over 100 of these 178 were appealed for non-decision, uh, which is a reflection of staff being overwhelmed and not being able to get these things processed in time. And that uh, is, is even more important now because of the new legislation, which we talked about last month, uh, if we don't get them done in time, we have to start giving refunds, which uh, ends up taking the money <laughs> that we have to pay for our planning uh, department. So time, staff time is a real issue in planning departments all across the province, and the pressures on staff with regard to refunds now are immense. And if you have a, a staff that is is overwhelmed by 
all kinds of things, things like this. Uh, they may get done, but they may not get done in the way that we want them to be done. Uh, and, and we expect good work and we expect uh, uh, time put into these things. So I'm just wondering if you can comment on our staff in terms of being able to manage the, uh, the workload in light of the refund issues and in light of the fact that developers now seem to be quick off the trigger to uh, uh, appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal with a success rate of 172 to 6, uh, and, and most of them are appealed on the basis of non-decisions. It, it's startling, really. Pam? Um, yeah, another excellent question. I won't take up too much time tonight on <laughs> to talk about staffing resources and challenges, but we are very busy in development. Um, Michael and I have talked about this. Um, we're hopeful to bring back some information and, and some training to the new council in December, and that will include some of our uh, challenges and resources. I can assure you that we have looked at Bill 109 with many of our colleagues across the province. We are preparing for January 1st. Uh, we are charting things out so that we can work with our developers and we have training sessions planned with them um, in November to identify some of the, um, the new challenges that we will all face and how we plan uh, to work with them on it. Um, so we're busy, uh, we're looking forward to the future, and we have a plan. Sorry. Michael? If I, if I could just add to that, and as Pam mentioned, we chatted about this the other day, and uh, some of the councillors remember we did a development approvals review in 2017, stretched in 2018, and we implemented it in the 2019 budget and it had an upstaffing component to it. It was one of the first things this council did. And we've agreed that we're actually going to brush up that, that development approvals review. I'm going to free up some of Mr. Crozier's time, work with Pam and her group, and one of the first, I think, probably reports that the new council would receive would be the update of that development approvals review, given the context of what Pam just talks, talked about with the Bill 109 and the and, and, and what we just talked about with, uh, with, with what's going on with the, uh, the OLT. So that if we do need more staff resources to avoid non, you know, OLT hearings for non-decisions or refunding developer fees uh, because we can't process them, you know, at least we, uh, you know, we, we have the staff resources to avoid that. So, so, so you can anticipate that, the new council can anticipate that uh, very early in its term. And because um, I, I think that's something we, uh, we need to do given the changing landscape. Councillor Pierce. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for you. Just a, a couple of quick comments. Um, first of all, I, again, I, I've seconded this motion, and, and I think this is this is critical moving forward. And I appreciate the, the staff time uh, that's going to have to be put into this. I know Pam, we had some discussion, and I kind of asked you about a timeline. And it, it, and I know it's very difficult to put on there, but I appreciate what you said earlier. In the you know, we're going to look at this holistically but we're going to look at short-term, medium-term, long-term things. So I, I think that's, in, in my mind, I think that's the best way to go about it. There might be some quick hits that we can do to, to help us out here. Um, but again, you know, as, as you know, and, and unless you're a planner, there's, there's and, and I, I suppose even planners, there's so much to learn and so much changing, and it's so fluid that it, almost on a day-to-day -day basis, things <coughs> seem to be changing. And I, I think... As long as we look at this, that you know, we push the envelope as far as we can to to you know to exceed any potential parking expectations. I, I think that's the way to do it because, as I say, we're always learning on this, and I learned something at the last planning meeting that that it's actually we we can kind of maneuver. It's not provincially driven, which. I and, and a lot of other people thought that with, with parking spots and stuff like that. So again, I appreciate that this, this is not a small task. It shouldn't be taken as a small task, but I totally appreciate the way that you're, you said you're going to look at it with the holistic view, but short-term, medium-term, long-term um, potential fixes, we'll call them. So thank you in advance for all the work that's going to be done on this. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Are there any other comments? Everyone's clear what they're voting on. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Uh, moving on to number 12, Councillor Gatward, you had something for other business? Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, first thing is I'd like to 
thank council and staff and the social club for the donation to the United Way in memory of my sister Diane who passed away on September 1st. Thank you very much. That was very appreciated and I've always been a big supporter of the United Way. So again, thank you. And my other thing was, do we have a weed inspector currently in the county? Clayton has retired, hasn't he? The reason I'm asking is I, I had a weed complaint in a new subdivision two months ago and the weeds still weren't cut. Michael? Thank you, Your Worship. Through you, uh, I, I think we have a number of bylaw enforcement officers that are uh, that are designated as weed weed control inspectors. So, if um, we can have a staff member reach out to Councilor Gatward in the morning and and find out where the where the concern is, we can address it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Gatward. Uh, anybody else have anything for new? I can't even tell you where my mind is right now. Is does anyone else have anything under new business? Seeing none. If these candidates don't run for the hills after this meeting, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why you're still here. Uh, motion to move in camera, please, Councilor Coleman. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Moved by myself, second by Councilor Wheat, that the County of Brant Council convene in camera to discuss a personal matter about an identifiable individual, including a municipal or local board employee and a position plan criteria or other instructions to be applied to any negotiations carried on or to be carried on by or on behalf of the municipality or local board. Thank you. All those in favor? Take a few minutes and we'll go in camera.
We have to ratify the in-camera decision. Councillor Howes, you have that? Uh, moved by myself and seconded by Councillor McAlpine that the Operation and Administration Committee in-camera report of September 20th, 2022 be approved. Thank you. Any discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? <laughs> Carried. Uh, bylaws, Councillor LaFerrier. Okay, for the last time, uh, bylaws, first reading, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Bell. Uh, bylaws 90-22 to 110-22, we now read a first time. All those in favor? Opposed? Second reading, please. Moved by myself and seconded by Councillor Bell that bylaws 90-22 to 110-22 now be read a second time and all clauses and preambles be adopted. Are there any questions to the second reading? Seeing none, all those in favor? And if you could read them for the third and final time, please. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Third reading, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Bell, that bylaws 91-22 to 110-22 now be read a third time, passed, signed, and sealed. All those in favor? Opposed and carried. Which takes us to number 15, which is uh, the next meeting in the adjournment. So this was the last meeting of the regular, of, of our term of council. There will be a special meeting on the 3rd of October, or November, sorry. Um, but it won't be a business meeting, it'll be a social meeting and uh, details will come out in that next agenda. Uh, I think we did a great job for four years. I think it was a great council. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know what to say. Wish everybody luck. And if I, the election doesn't go my way, I'm going to apply for that bylaw job, looking for weeds in Mount Pleasant or whatever. I, I would be good at it. So with that being said, I am looking for a motion to adjourn. Councillor Pierce. 